Donnie, give me one second. Oh man, you're looking fresh. Okay. Let's start with if you can hear me. Oh yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're not making that mistake again. I can hear you. Uh, one second. Uh, let's see. Okay, now. Um. Uh, I'm gonna pull your thing out. I'm gonna pop your thing out for a second. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Um. Uh, then. We're gonna do that, and then we're gonna do that. Okay. So welcome. And it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Uh, uh, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be. You're looking fresh, by the way. You got you got the you're wearing the salwar kameez, and then you're wearing uh, I don't know what that yeah, is. This is the this is the saraiki adrak. Ooh. So it's, uh, yeah, Ooh. it's kind of become a symbol of Saraiki nationalism nowadays. Ooh. Well, they, the, the nationalists claim that the history of this color is like four or five thousand years old. Uh, but this is actually, the Ajrak actually is basically Sindhi. They have the red version and we have this blue Saraiki. So yeah, it's very uh, common nowadays. You'll, you'll see Saraiki nationalists uh, wearing it. That's okay. So we're going to talk about uh, Saraiki Vaseb again. Uh, I think we're going to be yeah. talking about regionalism as well. Um, yeah. Um, so before I, for, before I forget, so uh, the chat can hear me, right? Yeah, chat should be. If, if I can hear you, they can hear you. Oh, okay, all right. If I can hear you, they can hear you. Um, first right. off, uh, if before you're, I... by the way, first off, yeah. if you're in chat, uh, I'm going to run the top of the hour ad break because I have to do that because Twitch makes me okay. do this. I have to run an ad break. Uh, if you okay. want to avoid the ads, you can subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime. Uh, it's like okay. 100 rupees in India, so subscribe. If you, do, if you yeah. want an interruptionless uh, conversation between me and Donnie, get in, get in, get in. Um, I also post, blasted it out on WhatsApp, put it out everywhere, and we're good to go. All okay. right, here's a three-minute ad. Um, okay, so talk to me. Uh, we, I mean, we've been chatting for quite a while. Uh, we've been... Yeah. Yeah. And... I mean, it's funny because like we have, uh, we basically have. Yeah, the my Pakistani moderator, the one person that needs to be in here, is gone. So he's not here, unfortunately. Um, okay. But no. Uh, yeah. So first off, uh, if for those of you who don't know, uh, this is Donnie Darko from Twitter. Uh, th he's a very high profile. Uh, I guess. He's 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 the Twitter guy from Pakistan. He's a Twitter dude. He's uh that's he's a very high profile guy. Uh I think you work I, I think last time you worked you said you worked with like people on you worked with universities regarding like English teaching or something like that. Something that uh... Well I recruit students for international universities in the US, in the UK, all over Europe. So I kind of work with the universities as a recruitment agent agent. So I find them students from Pakistan. Find ah, okay, so you work with uni okay, so you work with American and European and out, you know, uh, international uh schools basically. Got it. Yeah, pri primarily the UK. Okay, so got it. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so this okay, is Donnie before, Darko. Be Go ahead. Before I forget, before I forget and before I start blabbering, I I wanted to start with some of your comments that you made. Uh, uh -oh. one in the last in one in the last broadcast that we had. Oh, am I in uh, trouble? Uh, What's up? <laughs> yeah, it was uh something along the lines of uh no, I completely forgot about it. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's start with something you said uh to me uh on Twitter recently. Uh you said something about communists being class reductionists. Uh oh. So I really wanted to talk about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what what did you mean by that? Um so okay, so here's what I mean by that. Uh so what Which I usually mean wasn't it wasn't wasn't an attack. I really want to don't Yeah, I know no, I'm I know I know it's not an attack. So what I mean by that yeah. is like unfortunately, especially in this part of the world, uh people that are communists uh usually tend to gloss over legitimate grievances that especially ethnic minorities might have with the state or, you know, oppressed castes in, in the case of India might have with the communist party or with the state 
because uh, they use dialectical materialism, which is, you know, the sort of main ideology or the main sort of a form of analysis that they, you know, claim to adhere to, to basically say, well, because the most important part of any society is the relationship to the means of production and the economic relations that form the society, you don't have to, and because all of this forms the, all of this other culture war bullshit forms the superstructure, we don't actually have to seriously analyze and we don't have to seriously look at them. So that's what I usually, so it's a way for uh, communists to ignore legitimate social ills that cannot be addressed simply by focusing on, on the economics. And it's not to say that economics doesn't matter. It obviously does. But they use the fact that they used they use a very rigid form of analysis to justify their already preconceived biases towards uh, particular minorities. So if you look at uh, Sri Lanka, for example, one of the things that they'll do, I mean, the Communist Party there, the JVP, the biggest one, uh, they often basically say, you know, we don't, they couch their racism against Tamils in communist speak, basically saying like, well, no, what you should be focusing on is focusing on, you know, the workers and their relationship to the means of production, blah, 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 blah. And then you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't worry about, you know, autonomy and this 13th Amendment nonsense about uh, provincial councils. That doesn't matter. You shouldn't worry about that. Tamils don't deserve rights, blah, 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 blah. So that's, that's what I mean by class reductionist, right? It's a way of, it's a way for, uh, yeah, that's the, or, yeah, as, as someone in my chat said, that is the exact origin. I mean, that's the, the class reductionism comes from the fact that the majority of communists in, in high positions are from the upper castes. That's where the rift comes from, right? The class reductionism is just the method in which they, you know, go, you know, perpetuate casteism, right? And it's the same thing in Sri Lanka. And I would imagine, I mean, from what I've seen, the Pakistani communists are less bad about this because like communists are so marginalized in Pakistan that they kind of have to like stick together. Like you have to stick with uh, all different sorts of uh, movements. Uh, whereas like in, in Sri Lanka and in India, the communists have some level of power and they've become sort of arrogant as a result of that. Um, whereas in Pakistan, they've never once like held any level of any significant level of power. So they're, yeah. they're far more amenable to coalition building than the ones in India and Sri Lanka. So that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I think the communists and the socialists in Pakistan, they, they support the Bloch cause. I mean, I think they have to, uh, but I'd like to, I'd like to see some support for the Saraiki cause. I don't have you talked to Amar about, about this, Amar Ali John, Amar, uh, or Taimur Rahman for that matter? I'm sure they. Uh, I mean, Amar surely he Amar Ali John surely you know, he has spoken about the problems of the Sarai QC. I remember he had this uh, big political event in Lahore, and mm -hmm. he actually invi invited a Saraiki poet on the stage. And he delivered a speech and some poetry in Saraiki. So Amar is different from other socialists and uh, communists or whatever you want to call them. Uh, so now I remember what you said in your last broadcast. Before that, I want to ask, why can't I see you? Oh, uh, it's because uh, the way the screen is. So you have to see me on my screen. Because this the way we've done this, you'd have to see me on my stream. So it's switch.tv slash I don't know. Okay. Yeah, so, the camera uh, setup's a bit... Yeah, the, the camera setup's a bit different this time because I actually want oh, okay. to Yeah, because I actually have the browser pulled up. When we had it last time, the 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 yeah. setup was a bit awkward. So I wanted to make sure okay. that if you have any links I can actually show it to you. I can show oh, like fine. I can show chat the links. So that's okay, why that's, the setup's a bit different this time, yeah. Okay, no problem. Okay, now I remember what you said. You said India's main saving grace is regionalism. Yes. I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. It is India's, I 1000% agree with that. Even then, even with regionalism, I would say India has significant problems, right? Uh, for example, uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot express your real opinion on uh, Kashmir. Uh, that's the, that's one thing you can't do in India. You, without the fear of getting arrested, you cannot express your real opinion as uh 
what is happening to Arundhati Roy is, is, is showing us. You can't actually be, you can't actually be critical of the Indian government in places like Kashmir. Um, so you can't, otherwise you'll probably get arrested by UAPA. Um, but wait, was she, was she arrested or are there cases against her? Yeah, there okay. she's being, yeah, she's basically being tried under UAPA. She's like, there's a case against oh. her. So, okay. she, so she's, she's not actually like behind bars, right? She's just facing legal troubles. So. She's facing legal troubles, but she has the, like, she's going to jail. Basically, she's going to go to jail at some point. Oh, damn. And the statement was made 14 years ago, by the way. <laughs> she made a oh, statement God. 14 years ago. And now she's, you know, potentially facing uh, prison time for that. This is great. Wow. Fantastic. You In know, the world's largest democracy, this happens? Uh, India, I mean, I have to be honest. India hasn't been a democracy. Like, India's never been yeah. a democracy. UAPA, by the way, is not a recent law. Modi didn't pass this law. This law was pa passed oh. decades. It passed decade. It was passed decades ago under Congress. UAPA's uh, 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 UAPA is like a um, it's like a very it's a it's basically like a prevention of terrorism act. Um, oh. We have these kind of laws here. You yeah. Say anything, and you get tried under the anti-terrorism law. Or whatever. Bingo. Yeah, it's the same yeah. thing. So UAPA has been it's been on the books since 1967. Like that's how right. it's a colonial era law, basically. Um, okay. So it's like a. It's, so, about so I want to get back to the the saving grace of regionalism. Yeah. So um, yeah. basically, the reason I think India hasn't fallen apart quite yet, uh, and it hasn't completely you know turned into bits, is because you have certain like powerful. Powerful ish regions uh, in India, especially in Tamil Nadu and Kerala and, and in southern India, that are that have their own sort of economic and, and socio political interests. That, um, and, and, and the other thing is like there's an identity that can very easily be formed um, to, to counter Hindu nationalism. A great example of this is the Tamil identity in, in Tamil Nadu. Um, part of the reason that the BJP's tactics don't work all that well in Tamil Nadu is because uh, we are very, I mean, the DK and the DMK and all of these like Dravidian national movements have done a fantastic job of basically positioning Tamil Nadu against the center, right? And what that mean, and what I mean by that is because, I mean, it's not, it's not like they've done a good job positioning it. It's really ultimately the center's fault. Right, it's the center's yeah. fault for this, right? Um, but the center has always been trying to impose like their whatever they consider to be like Indian nationalism, and 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 part of that is Hindi imposition and stuff, right? So they've been trying to enforce Hindi, they've been trying to enforce like North Indian cultural norms upon Tamil Nadu, and as a result of that, and because we also saw Brahmins as agents of that in Tamil Nadu, as agents of North Indian cultural imposition, we basically. Uh, we basically said, no, we don't want anything to do with this crap. We don't want anything to do with this nonsense. Fuck off. We're going to learn Tamil. We like our language. We love our language. Our language is older than your Hindi. Piss off, right? Our language is a classical language, right? Like, I, again, one of the reasons I talk about language a lot is like, especially, and as you know, in this subcontinent, language is politics to a certain degree. You cannot avoid it, right? You can't avoid it at all, right? Um, so... It's so it's part of the formation of that Dravidian, like inclusive, somewhat progressive identity where like it doesn't matter what religion you are. If you're if you speak Tamil, you're Tamil. Right. So you can be Muslim, yeah. you can be Christian, you can be Jain, you can be Buddhist, you can be Hindu. It does not matter. Right. As long as you speak Tamil, you're Tamil and you should be proud about being Tamil against uh, the center who has been trying to get rid of your um, who has been trying to get rid of your, uh, you know, who's been seriously trying to get rid of your culture, right? It's, it's, that's sort of the overall simple, you know, simplistic narrative, right? And that's right. what, uh, and I think that is potentially served as a really good bulwark against the center. And PTR, who was the former, uh, I think it was the finance minister of Tamil Nadu or something, uh, he, he did a fantastic, uh, he did a fantastic rebuttal as to why 
the the center did like BJP got completely routed in Tamil Nadu. Not not only did the BJP lose in Tamil Nadu all 40 out of 40 seats, but even their allies didn't win. ADMK didn't win. None of none of the not a single seat went to NDA in Tamil Nadu. Every single seat went to the DMK alliance. It went to India alliance. Every you single must be seat very pleased with that. Oh, I've been running victory laps around the other South Indian states. <laughs> I've been I've been saying nah Tamil Nadu is the only South Indian state, guys. You guys can uh, piss off with that shit. Kerala, uh, oh yeah, yeah, Kerala's progressive. Well, uh, uh, yeah, what about yeah? You elected Suresh Gopi. How about that, right? I've been running raps. I've been running laps around Kerala for like the longest time, uh, because so you're, you're a proud you're a proud Tamil these days. I mean, you've always been a proud Tamil. But a little oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, like. Yeah, like I mean, I meme about it because sometimes the 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 Dravidian nationalism and like the pride in the Tamil language can get a little overboard. Um, I mean, you have people saying ridiculous, you know, nonsense about like Kumari Kandam and like these ancient continents or whatever the fuck that sunk into the ocean like several thousand years ago or some nonsense like that, right? But, um, but. Overall, I, I genuinely think that uh, regional pride has done a really good job of ha being a really good bulwark against the the center for, for quite a while. I think it continues to remain uh, a really good bulwark, and I think it's not just that. I think what's I think what the DK and the DMK and the self respect movement head by uh, headed by Tande Periyar did and i think what was a stroke of genius was they actually wove progressive politics into the tamil identity right so when the the whole self-respect movement was happening one of the things that periyat did was he actually made it he actually officiated he officiated like uh mixed caste marriages or what he called like uh self-respect marriages uh i mean no it's not just mixed caste marriages but basically a self-respect relationship. So he also supported live-in relationships as well, which for the 30s and 40s was revolutionary, right? Like supporting live-in relationships since the 30s and 40s of India, that's unheard of, right? Yeah. So he basically, in a stroke of genius, wove progressive politics into the Tamil identity. Now, obviously, Tamils overall, like we still ad adhere to like casteism and, and, you know, we have our own social ills still to this day. But there's a sort of North Star, if you will, right, that you can look towards to be like, okay, this is probably what we should be doing anyways, right? We should probably be more progressive anyways. We should probably be, be working towards a casteless society anyways, right? And so that's what Periyat did, right? That's what, uh, that's what a lot of these uh, uh, Ayodhya Das and Periyat and, and all of these like uh, Tamil leaders did originally. They, they wove the the progressive anti-caste identity anti-brahminical identity anti-brahminism identity into tamil nadu right which is why none of the stuff about like and and another thing that helps is that um the the dmk has done a fantastic job of administering the temples that we have and also another thing that helps is that um tamil nadu has the highest number of temples of any state in india both per capita and per like just in, in raw total right we have the highest number of temples of any particular uh of any particular state so a lot yeah, of that I stuff i didn't know that yeah so we're literally called the land of temples for that reason right so none of the stuff about like how how the muslims and the christians are converting people and they're trying to like all none of the hindu nationalist rhetoric has really stuck in tamil nadu to the same degree um yeah, there is some controversy over the DMK. I mean, but the DMK, but like it that stuff doesn't work anyways, right? Like first off, the DMK isn't destroying temples, quote unquote. And then the second thing is uh if you first if you want to talk about destroying temples and you want to well, you want to talk about destroying things nearby, right? Uh you have to look at the BJP and Ayodhya first because they also did that. And then the third thing is it, like in the grand scheme of things, Tamil Nadu still has the highest number of temples of any state in India by far, right? So, like none of that rhetoric has worked, and it's because there has been been this regional identity that has maintained for several decades against uh, 
uh, the 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 main sort of uh, the Hindu nationalist rhetoric of the the center, right? And I think uh, I think and and this is probably like my biggest. I mean, among several criticisms of Pakistan, but I think one of the things where Pakistan went really really wrong was the imposition of Urdu. I think that was one yeah, of the. That, I think that's one of the really, things. Really, really wanted to talk about it. Yeah. I think that's one of the things where Pakistan went horrifically wrong because now, because what you have in Pakistan is you, I mean, I think part of the reason that you have this overwhelming influence of these like far right Mulvies in Pakistan is that is, I think it has something to do with the fact that everyone speaks that language, right? It's because like, uh, like it's kind of like Urdu is kind of like I intrinsically met and meshed with the idea of a Muslim identity in Pakistan, right? And the Pakistani identity as well. And the Pakistani identity as well. And as a result, regional languages like you know Saraiki, Sindhi, Punjabi, uh, Brahui, Balochi, Pashto, and so on and so uh, Pashto, so on and so forth, they have been severely neglected as a result of this. Like it's not like they don't speak it. But there isn't as much of an emphasis, and especially in the Pakistani diaspora. Like most Pakistanis I know, uh, do not. Most Pakistani diaspora uh, people I know, they do not speak the language uh, that they come from, right? They they speak if they speak you know a language from Pakistan at all, they speak Urdu, right? Um, and that's it. They don't. They don't. Uh, I think that's where I think Pakistan went horrifically wrong. I think it, it's because it didn't allow for the development of separate regional identities. Um, yeah. And because they tried to do it on... With the, go ahead. It actually started with Jinnah. So Jinnah said Urdu is going to be the only language. He couldn't even pronounce the word Urdu properly, but he said Urdu will be the state language and only Urdu. And I think, if I'm not wrong, if there are any Bengalis or anyone who knows better than me i think there was this thing called uh bhasha and or something in 1952 uh where there were protests and uh, the the bengalis were quite angry with what whatever jinnah and liaquat ali khan had done initially and there was bloodshed and some people actually believe that uh oppression of the bengali language uh, was one major cause that led to 1971. so it right. all started with Jena and Yaqut Ali Khan, and then Ayub Khan came, who was from KP or something. So he did the same thing. So it's like uh, even Yaya Khan, and then the, the Punjabi general, Ziaul Haq, everyone uh, played their part, in, even Zulfakar Ali Bhutto's. I don't know why, who gave them these ideas. So everyone played a part in Urdu imposition, no matter what ethnic background they were from. So from Jena, uh, to Laqat Ali Khan, to Ayub Khan, to Zulfakar Ali Bhutto, to Yaya Khan, and until today. So uh, how it happened was they made Urdu the medium of education or instruction at, at schools, uh, and the state broadcast, because we, we didn't have a lot of uh, media, or private media back then, so the, the radio and the state TV, they would uh, promote Urdu. So I don't know whose idea it was, and, what was the thinking behind it? I think what I understand is there's this thing called Nazaria Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to trans exactly translate it in English, but it's basically uh, something to do with the two-nation theory. And they, uh, we, I've heard that this term, Nazaria Pakistan, so Nazaria actually means uh, ideology, so the ideology of Pakistan. Uh, I've been told by some well-read people that this term was actually coined a lot later. I mean, maybe in the late 50s or 60s so it's it's just to support that fake nazaria pakistan thing and uh, you know one nation one identity and all that so it i think pakistan's always been against regionalism pakistan's I mean, always been against ethnic nationalism is ethnic nationalism that bad and why why do we hate ethnic how do you define ethnic nationalism um I think ethno, I, so I think there are, my personal thing is I'm not a fan of nationalism to begin with because uh, it can, it, like, there are certain issues, there are certain places where nationalism can very easily devolve into very far right reactionary, like, uh, thinking, right? Uh, 
that's precisely a lot of my criticisms with Tamil nationalism. Even though lots of Tamil nationalists I know are generally speaking left wing, there are again because it's it's focused around the Tamil identity and it's not necessarily like inclusive of say the Sri Lankan Muslim identity or the the other you know minority identities of the of the coasts of Sri Lanka of of Elam, right? Um, my biggest criticism of that is is it's very it can very easily lead to reactionary thinking, right? And it often does, unfortunately. So, and and another example of this is Canada regional nationalism, right? Um, because there isn't like a coherent, like progressive message attached to it, right? It's largely speaking, it's not as like coherent as like the progressivism that is laced with the Dravidian nationalism of Tamil Nadu. Um, the Canada regionalism uh, often devolves into just like, it often devolves into straight xenophobia, right? Towards like North Indians and, and Tamils as well. Um, even though like, obviously like if you're in, and it also devolves sometimes into chauvinism against Tulu and, and the other minority languages of Karnataka uh, and the other minority communities of uh, Karnataka. So I do have my issues with, uh, you know, regional ethnic nationalism, but I think my thing is like, as so long as it's used in a progressive manner, so long as the message is, hey, we just want self-determination, so long as we want to preserve our language against like a hegemonic power, I don't think there, I mean, if that's the overall message of it and you want to call it nationalism, then fine, I don't have a problem with that. But if it's like, no, this is this land is ours, no one else is allowed to, then that's where it gets, that's where it gets very uh, problematic. Um, where where yeah, it gets, where it gets- one of my friends who, who is a senior bureaucrat, and he said the same thing. He's probably the only guy who said that. He, he said the same thing, that Saraiki nationalism must have a progressive element. We sh this movement needs to be inclusive. But when I talk to the traditional Saraiki nationalists, they, uh, what have, I mean, it's just a few people that I've talked to, so maybe I'm generalizing, but... Uh, for example, they don't they don't seem to care about the people of Karachi. The Saraiki nationalists are very pro PPP, the Pakistan mm -hmm. People's Party, uh, for whatever reasons. I mean, uh, yes, the Pakistan People's Party uh, has done a few good things for the Saraiki cause. Uh, they've tried, I mean, not not good enough, but yeah. So uh, and they've been popular in this area. They don't have a lot of vote bank. Well, they, I think they have no vote bank left in Upper Punjab or the northern side, only in Lahore or Gujarat or other places. But they do have uh, a great deal of support in Bhutan, Muzaffargarh, uh, these areas. So the Saraiki nationalists, uh, the, the, the traditional Saraiki nationalists, they're like uh, they say I don't know, derogatory things about people of Karachi, who identify as Mohajis, the Urdu-speaking community. Uh, so I think uh, the the middle class Urdu speaking community cannot be held accountable for the Urdu imposition that happened by dictators or I mean, I agree. even by Zulfikar So I don't see a lot of progressiveness and uh, a lot of inclusivity in this Raiki nationalist cause. But I think I hope young people like I was mentioning my friend uh, when I he when I when I heard him say that. I was I started to really think about it that yes uh, and after that I really started to interact with people from Karachi uh, and uh, some traditional Saraiki nationalists uh, tried to you know uh, discourage me no I mean they they were like no people of Karachi are fine I mean they're more educated than us uh, they they're doing okay financially it's us you should be talking about don't talk about the people of Karachi don't talk about the Mahajars. Uh, and then they would bring in the MQM and Aldaf Hussain. I mean, I mean, if even if MQM had a militant wing, and if they were involved in uh, uh, terrorist activities, I mean, you can't blame the the whole community for that. I mean, yeah, I were... mean, yeah, I I totally agree with that. I mean, and the other thing about Saraiki Vase movement, I from what I've understood, when I've from what I've understood is that. There's one other thing about it is like there's a huge economic disparity between, you know, what is Saraiki Vaseb slash South Punjab 
uh, and, and the rest of Punjab. And I think there's a real thing there where you can also make Saraiki Vase, the Saraiki Vase movement also a workers' movement, right? Yeah. There's a, there's a real opportunity there to basically make, like, champion the workers in that particular cause. And if you do that, then, you know... Tell, tell, that, tell that to Marley John. Oh, yeah. No, I will. I mean, if you can get Amar Ali John, if you can talk to Amar Ali John and be like, yo, there's this dude I want that that wants to have you on the show. That'd be great. For sure. If you can tell yeah, Amar that, that'd be fantastic. Uh, I'll talk to him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a huge like there's a huge I, I think. Well, it's not like there's a huge opportunity there. I would say that uh, it's just like it's already part of the like. It's it's part and parcel of the what Saraiki workers are going through right now. They are significantly poorer than the rest of of Punjab. The budget allocation for you know southern Punjab is like what I think several billion, like maybe ten dozen billion yeah. worse. I mean, done dozen billion less than northern Punjab. I think there's a. I think if you, I think, I think you can say that the Saraiki Vaseb issue is also a working class issue. Right, it is both. You cannot separate the two, right? Um, that's what I would say. My my personal opinion on it. Um, it's it's a mix of that, and I think Saraiki Vaseb has the opportunity to the the movement for Saraiki Vaseb has the opportunity to bring up you know issues of people like uh, you know the Potuar, you know people other regional identities like Potuar, or yeah. Um, I mean, again, Balochistan, you know, the Baloch national movement has been going on for, for decades at this point. Uh, and, and Pashtuns have mobilized as part of the PTI, right? For the most part. And, and, and along other Pashtun nationalist organizations as well. No, the PTM. Uh, PTM as well. The Pasht yeah. Um, and what was it? His, what was his name? Uh, Man Manzur, Man Manzur Pashtin. Manzur Pashtin, yes. Manzur Pashtin is a, what a huge... Guy. What? What a guy. Yeah. What a dude. guy. I love him. Dude, he's awesome. Manzur Pashtin is yeah. awesome. Um, yeah, like there, I think this has the ability to ignite um, other, uh, you know, other demands for regional identity and 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 other, you know, other movements. And I saw, I was saw in your comments when you uh, uploaded the video uh, of us talking. You, there were some people saying like, you know, well, we want to preserve our language. Like I'm Potuari and I want to preserve my Potuari language. What's going on here, right? And and like maybe Saraiki was say maybe the, the 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 first you know I guess step in that, right? And that's what yeah. I think is really that's what I think is uh, really important about Saraiki was I think I try to imagine a more inclusive Bengali nationalism for West Bengal. Yes. So what I've gathered and understood from our conversation so far is that ethnic nationalism isn't bad if it's uh, directed in a progressive and inclusive way. And some uh, One of my Twitter mutuals uh, said the other day, he said something like, ethnic nationalism is stupid because it's illiberal. So I, I didn't ask him what he meant, but I'd like your comment on that. I mean, he's technically correct in a sense that it is illiberal. It is not a liberal... Uh... It is technically not liberal, but yeah. uh, I would much rather have the existence of a Saraiki Vasay movement in in response to Pakistani nationalism uh, and, yeah. I guess, far-right Islamic fundamentalism in Pakistan uh, as opposed to not having it, I guess, and having the 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 clergy and, and the far-right and the Pakistani nationalists as a whole have complete uh you know control over the discourse and and the military obviously is just letting all of this happen because these far right actors are beneficial to them maintaining their power anyways so yeah. i would much and rather it, yeah. have these movements like saraiki vaseb and potuar and um, baloch movements than not right i yeah. think they pre i think they provide a very good bulwark against it yeah so basically Regionalism can also be Pakistan's saving grace. I agree. No, as, I think has the potential to be. Oh, I agree. I think uh, it's like I said uh, in our last. Uh, it's like I said in our last conversation. Pakistan and India are effectively the exact same country, 
uh people will swear up and down that they're not like i had okay i was uh talking to a, a larger twitch streamer uh, a larger streamer on the platform uh who covers politics and we were talking about the indian elections right and yeah. I, we were talking about like how Hindi and Urdu are, Urdu are basically the same language. And I had Hindu nationalists in the comments saying, oh, they're not the same language. You, the opinion discarded. They're not the same language. Urdu's written in uh, Arabic script and Hindi's written in Devan. I'm like, okay, you're, okay, first off, Punjabi. What, how about that? Punjabi's yeah. written in two scripts. What about that? Same language. Yeah. They're considered to be the same language, right? But it's written in two scripts. What about that? Uh, like this is not that's not doesn't mean anything um yeah that's so but like th this is what i mean i think i think regionalism also can present a saving grace for northern india as well i think mm. bojpuri mithila you know this sort of linguistic regionalism i think that can present as a bulwark against nationalism it it has its own problems obviously but i think those I think those the problems presented by that with you know regional clashes between like Boj, you know Bojpuris and and uh, Maithilis with the, I think the clashes between those two are preferable to you know Hindus versus Muslims in India if I'm going to be honest. Um yeah. I think that I think that's a much more preferable situation to be in because right now the way North India works is that it's partially like basically the entirety i mean you do have these regional identities like bojpuri uh, maithili and different these languages right but one the indian government considers them all to be part of hindi which is ridiculous right they're they're yeah. all considered to be dialects of hindi and then the other thing is um the the that leads to the situation in northern india in north india where it's basically the because the regional identity is gone it means that the only remaining major identity in the region is your religion. And so that's what helps ratchet up the Hindu versus Muslim tensions as well. Obviously, there's, you know, caste components to it as well, because a lot of the, uh, you know, Muslims are, are in many cases oppressed caste as well in India. Um, so there's also a caste angle to that as well. But generally speaking, if the regional identity was there, that would be one less like, there is some like re, you know regional linguistic nationalism not nationalism but some regional linguistic identity some sort of uh thing to 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 be there i think there would be a i think we would be in a much better place overall if i'm going to be honest yeah now that i'm thinking about it i think uh pakistani state has all, always had problems with uh, uh ethnic nationalism or regionalism i mean they declared Bacha Khan, who was, I don't know, the founder of BNP or something. Uh, he was a Pashtun nationalist, a big figure. Uh, so he was in prison for years, and they've always hated the, the Baloch nationalists. And uh, I mean, even, I mean, I think even today, not just the state, the whole society, I, I feel like the whole Pakistani society as a whole, they're, they're really downplaying the importance of regional linguistic diversity. And uh, I don't know. Uh, they're not. I mean, we, the conversation that we're having. What I understand is, it's a good thing. I mean, you said you know it was regionalism was important to fight uh, uh, whatever the Hindu bhaktas were trying to do. Uh, and I think it's important in Pakistan as well. The the fake um, identity, the Pakistani identity, the enforced, imposed Pakistani identity, identity that they're trying to impose on everyone. I and I and I feel like in, in the context of these two countries, uh, regional linguistic diversity, ethnic nationalism, regionalism, this seems very important. I mean, this is what uh, PTM is trying to do. Uh, their whole message is to protect the Pashtuns, protect right. their areas. And so right. I don't know why why people are not understanding it. When I talk about the Saraiki Vasib, they make me feel guilty about it. I mean, they're like you're. I mean, oh, so they they would make me feel guilty in a way like, like you care about a language. I mean, you want to make a province based on an ethnicity. How how you? You're a monster. I uh, mean, I mean, I, I well, here's my response to that. That emphasis on a language, that emphasis on a regional identity, is what 
managed to, in a sense, I mean, among many other things, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, like, the BJP lost Uttar Pradesh because of the, the Rajputs is getting angry at them because the BJP was allocating seats for Jats, Jats more than, than the Rajputs, among many other things, right? But historically, like, the reason BJP lost Karnataka in the Karnataka regional, like, in the Karnataka legislative assembly elections is because uh, they had thought that they could just plop a puppet into Karnataka in the name of Bomai and completely ignore the the social dynamics of Karnataka. They they pissed off the Lingayat community of Karnataka by kicking out Yadirupa, right? And so that pissed them off, right? And Bomai was already incompetent to, be, uh, to begin with. And the other thing is, uh, there's uh, been a, like what Congress did is they, also played to the regionalism of Karnataka. They've played to the regional identity of Karnataka. And one of the things that uh, now Congress is doing, as far as I can tell, is that they're actually being a lot better of being inclusive of the, uh, the, the local, the indigenous identities of Karnataka. So not just the Kanadigas, but the Tuluvas, the Koravas, and, and all different, uh, you know, different regional uh you know, the, the indigenous people of Karnataka. So they're doing a lot better job of that. And because of that, they're generally speaking a lot more successful at the state level. And in, and again, I bring up Tamil Nadu as a great example of this as well. Tamil Nadu literally blocked, gave no quarter to the BJP because there was already a, a strong Dravidian Tamil identity in, in Tamil Nadu that basically allowed them to say, well, what are you giving me? You're not giving anything to me. You're threatening to take away my language. You're threatening to take away administration of, like, my temples are perfectly fine. I don't know what you want to do with them. You're threatening to take away, like, I have Muslim friends. Why are you trying to bring that nonsense in here? All right, I have Christian friends. Why are you trying to bring that hate, you know, hate and nonsense in here? Why are you trying to impose your culture on us? Right? So it it, it allowed Tamil Nadu to basically say, no, piss off. We're done with you. We We want... They voted for the BJP in, in, you know, 2014 as a result of the fact that they were allied with ADMK. And then they realized, oh, God, we made a mistake by, you know, voting for ADMK. And then uh, in the subsequent years, they, they flipped. They flipped to DMK. And now DMK's, uh, you know, strangled. I mean, not, they, they, now DMK is like more, even more entrenched in Tamil Nadu because BJP is presented as the other option, effectively. and like BJP is outright anti-Tamil. There's no question about it, right? So I would say, I mean, if, if, you, if your friends were to say that, if your friends were to be like, well, why, why do you care so much about this regional you know, nonsense? I would say, well, no, this can actually change the election results, at least in a country like India. It can be very significant. It, like these sorts of things can be very, very significant. And that's why I, I place a heavy emphasis on regionalism. Right, having a regional identities uh, is is super important. Right, yeah. that's I why it can change. It can change the it can change the course of elections, and it can change the course of uh, uh, you know, national discourse even. What I'm thinking about is the Pakistan sectarian problem, the the rise of TLP, uh, which was again state sponsored, uh, and. Uh, the extremism, the extremism nowadays against the Ahmadis as well, it's rising. Before yeah. It was the Shias. Uh, so I don't know uh, what can be done. I mean, the state won't do anything because these groups, I don't know, kind of represent them. Uh, they use them whenever they want to for their street power to topple governments and all, you know. Uh, I don't know. Do you think uh, regionalism or... Uh, regionalism in Pakistan can somehow uh, help with that? Yes. Even oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you how that can happen. Uh, because it's, again, we go back to Tamil Nadu, for example. The, the greatest example of this is Tamil Nadu. And uh, again, the reason there isn't as much communal violence between religions in, in Tamil Nadu is because of that Tamil identity. That's the main reason. Because it does not matter what religion you belong to, right? Right whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, whether you're um, 
whether you're Jain, Buddhist, uh, Sikh, does not matter where you come from. You are still Tamil if you speak the language, right? So this regional uh, identity, this, you know, this regional uh, nationalism is not the word that I want to use for it. I would say, because uh, it's technically not the term, but like these regional movements uh, for preserving regional identities, um, I think they can serve also as a bulwark for religious minorities as well. Because it gives them a, a sort of safe place to, to, to find home. And it allows them to be like, all right, well, listen, we might not share the same religion, right? And first off, I, 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 di I disagree with the idea that Ahmadis aren't Muslim. So let's, let's, let's throw that out of the way. But, uh, but it allows people that, um, I, like, it allows people that come from various different regional identities, whether they're Hindus, whether they're Christians, whether they're Muslims, whether they're, you know, Sikhs or whatever, right? It allows them to identify with a particular region and it allows them to identify with a particular language. And so there's a level of camaraderie that can be built, right? And like a great example is like a lot of the, some of the major actors in, in Tamil cinema are Muslims themselves. Nasir is a great example. Uh, the gro One of India's greatest composers to ever come out, like one of the, the subcontinent actually, one of the subcontinent's greatest composers to ever come out A.R. Rahman is a Tamil Muslim, Tamil Muslim yeah. guy, right? And if you look at the way he moves, I mean, one, he, he yells, like whenever someone's asking him a question in Hindi, he's just like, I, in Hindi, I go, right? He's like, I don't, I don't speak Hindi. Like, and then he'll just run away or whatever. But like it, it, but again, it, it, that's a demonstration of what I'm saying. A.R. Rahman, even though he, I mean, he is a Muslim and in, in a North Indian context, it puts him under a lot of targets. Under the Tamil context, under the Tamil regional context, he's safe. He's relatively speaking safe in comparison, right? And it's because it doesn't matter, again, at least overall in the concept of, of the Tamil regional identity, it doesn't matter what religion you belong to. And it's the same thing. I mean, obviously, you still have problems within Kerala, and you still have some level of sectarianism in Kerala, but it's that you kind of see the same thing there. It doesn't matter what religion you belong to. You're still Malayali. It does not matter. That's why you have figures like Mamuti. You have figures like Dulkar Salman. You have uh, various Muslim and Christian actors. You have various prolific Muslim and Christian actors from uh, uh, in in and in, uh, in, in Kerala media, right? In in uh, Mal in Malayalam cinema, and cinema is a reflection of the populace, right? And so. Basically, what I'm getting at is it can very easily save, it can, barely, it can very easily serve as a safe haven for religious minorities, this, re, this regional nationalism. I genuinely think, not regional nationalism, but regionalism, I think that uh, this, I think regionalism is the antidote to, to Pakistan. I really think. I, I think all of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Pakistan's woes can be solved by the Tamil Nadu formula, I think. I genuinely think that um, yeah, regionalism will save India, will create assimilable identities that are pan-religion and caste. Yes, exactly. It's the opposite of this. Pakistan was literally built on the basis of religious identity taking center stage. Yeah, it's the India at least has the pretense of like being a secular state, even though the BJP has like been in power for like the past 10 years or so. Right. At least India constitutionally is a secular country. Right. So we have that pretense of like, well, it doesn't matter like where you come from, right? Um, the way I see it in an ideal world, we wouldn't have to fall back on regional identities, but the fact of the matter is in a world where so many of us are oppressed is a good shortcut. Yeah, that's my perspective. I think regional identities is a shortcut. It's not a band, it's not a, it's not an actual like, it's not a replacement for your immune system, but it, it's, it's like taking aspirin basically. It's like taking a uh, Tylenol. Right, it's not an actual replacement for your immune system doing all the work, right? But it can serve as an easy rallying point. Is my point? It can serve as a very easy rallying. You know, uh, it's a painkiller. Exactly. I think it serves as a great rallying point for people of marginalized identities to come together, and I think that's where regionalism really comes in. The Saraikis of uh, of Southern Punjab and Saraiki Wasave are oppressed by basically the Punjabi nationalists and the uh, overall Pakistani state structure as well that have been neglecting them the entire time. The Punjab, uh, the Punjab provincial government has been, uh, you know, oppressing Saraikis by 
you know, for example, not allocating enough, you know, in the budget for them or outright denying the existence of Saraiki people, right? Uh, outright basically saying Multan is little more than like Punjab or whatever. So I think this, these sorts of movements play, I think they can do a really good job of combating that. And I really, in my heart of hearts, I genuinely think that it is like, I think this is like the solution to a lot of uh, Pakistan's problems. Uh, it's it's Pakistan. The Pakistani state is specifically founded on a pan subcontinental Muslim identity, and you see this when uh, you see this when like uh, Indian Muslims get oppressed, right? Uh, you'll see Pakistani nationalists chirp, and they they'll decide to chime in and be like. Uh, um, they they like not, like whenever indian muslims get oppressed or they get attacked they'll be like oh thank thank god for pakistan or alhamdulillah for pakistan or some shit like that and it's like thank you jinnah thank, thank you jinnah Jinnah, that sort of thing they'll say shit like that and it's like well yeah. hold on a second you're fucking wrong about that because one i have Mus i have muslim friends from india you're fucking insane they like being indian what the fuck's wrong with you like they they're happy to be indian cuz they have they like the diversity that they grew up in they like i have a muslim friend from bangalore perfectly fine she like they like being uh they like being indian they're fine you know uh so it's also ridiculous i mean they have they obviously have issues with india to to be fair cuz again they they're muslim and they're going to be oppressed in india but like it's it's one that's number one and then the second thing is uh, I mean, Pakistan is quite unlike, at least in India, you have a pretense of, you know, secularism. In Pakistan, it used to be that way under Jinnah, but that ship has sailed like decades earlier. That yeah. ship sailed decades earlier, especially with Ziaullah coming to power and, and, and Yahya yeah. Khan coming to even, power. Even before that, I think even before that, even in the, in the 1950s, there were... Uh, um, a massive protest against the Emirates. Jinnah appointed Sir Zafrullah Khan as the foreign minister, I think, and Sir Zafrullah Khan was an Emiri, and he was a great leader. He was a great uh, lawyer uh, leader. I think he served in the International Court of Justice or something, and he basically, I think, drafted the resolution of Pakistan. And and Jinnah dies in the 1950s, the jamaat e Islami and the Maududi and other, his other friends. Uh, they want, I think, they wanted Zafrullah Khan to be removed, and they. So in the fifties, that hatred, bigotry, all that against the Emirates started, and eventually, in the constitution of the nineteen seventy-three constitution against Bhutto, they were declared non-Muslims. So uh, the Islamization of Pakistan had already begun in uh, in the nineteen fifties, and it got worse and worse and worse. And today. Uh, we have these blasphemy allegations, people mob mob lynching, people killing some innocent family or someone in the streets. Uh, so it's been pretty much a horrible journey with Islamization and extremism. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, but I think the the silver lining to that is that Pakistan has already kind of hit rock bottom. And yeah. that's, you guys have already kind of hit rock bottom, if I'm going to be fair. And yeah. the only way is up. Uh, and I think, like I said, I think, you know, demanding things like Saraiki Vaseb or, you know, demanding like recognition for Potuari as a separate language or demanding, you know, education in the mother tongue, for example, like demanding education in, if you're in, or demanding actual I don't know whether the Pashtun nationalists have done anything about the the Kalash people of uh, Chitral. I I don't know if they've done anything about that, but they're they're a unique group of people that need to you know that need to have their cultural identity protected as well. Um, yeah. Because they practice their own sort of religion. Um, I think it's like proto Hinduism or something like that. Uh, yeah. They they practice their own you know religion that needs to be protected as well as as they're an ethnic minority and also an ethno religious minority for that matter. There are plenty of regional identities all across Pakistan that need to be preserved and they need to be. Um, and I think part of the way is, I, I don't know how it is. You don't receive, at, there is no schools that teach you Saraiki. There are no, uh, or well, are there? 
my dad and his friends really worked on this. So we don't have uh, Saraitin schools, uh, but at uh, post secondary education or higher secondary education, so the eleventh and the twelfth grade has an optional Saraiti subject, and uh, we had this two year BA thing, which is which isn't uh, there anymore, I think. So we had uh, Saraiti as an optional subject in a two year BA degree, uh, and now we have. Uh, a master's degree in Saraiki, so even PhD is being done in Saraiki. So it's not really uh, become a part of the school curriculum or a, it ha hasn't become a medium of instruction, but it is being taught as a, as a separate language as a subject. Yeah, that's a problem that needs to be fixed immediately. <laughs> As a problem that needs to be fixed because we do have Tamil medium schools, we have Kannada medium schools, we have Telugu medium school schools, we do have Malayalam medium schools. I mean, India has this problem of like people still taking English education in English medium schools because unfortunately, India has become a service sector economy for the West, anyways. Like most, yeah. like, like every, like all the high paying jobs, high paying jobs in India are IT jobs. And those are jobs that require you to speak English. So it's just a straight yeah. pipeline for everyone to go through the education system so that they can learn English, make it into like, you know, larger IT teams or just working with teams in the West. And uh, ultimately that's what, uh, and, and that's how, you know, these sort of uh, mother tongue medium schools are, are being dilapidated. Um, there's a school that I saw recently, very recently, um, where they where they are teaching uh, they are so there's a uh, Adivasi language called Gundi. It was a it was a it was a article released by Scroll In Scroll dot In, and they were it's a it's a Adivasi indigenous language called Gundi, and they are making they made a school, uh, the Gundi community made a school for that particular language for that particular culture, and they've married some of their own indigenous practices and and sort of Western style education, and they've basically merged it together to preserve their culture. And I think that's, and they're now seeking official, uh, uh, official, they're, they're basically spe uh, seeking the, the judicial system's blessing. But I think... Uh, that's, that's great, right? That's brilliant. Oh, it's great. I mean, that's what I think, yeah. as much as like I shit on India and as much as I criticize India, I think that is, I've always said this, I think that is the best part about India. It is the linguistic diversity and it is the, is just the sheer and utter cultural diversity of India. I think that is the best thing about India by far. Um, I don't think I, nothing comes close to it. Uh, uh, America has done a piss poor job, to say the least, uh, of preserving its native cultures uh, in that they are continuing to try and erase the native cultures, but that's a different story for, for, for uh, another day. But um, no, I think... I think the best way forward, uh, and I think this gets to a broader thing about cooperation among people of the subcontinent. I think it gets to a broader point of like, I think we need to really stop thinking about the subcontinent in terms of like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, so on and so forth, right? Because again, all of these nations are basically, basically cooked up by colonial powers. They're post-colonial states. They're basically yeah. cooked up by like India as a concept didn't exist until 1947. Pakistan was literally Jinnah's pet project. Who are we deluding here, right? The only, like, who are we actually deluding here? Nepal, Nepal might be different because they've been a kingdom for quite a while. Um, and and uh, Bangladesh is always, uh, um, but, and Bangladesh has always been predominantly Bengali. Uh, for, for the most part. But even they have their own problems with ethno-state nonsense that they're doing towards indigenous people, Adibashis. Um, no, I think we really have to stop thinking about uh, the subcontinent from like a national level. I really think we have to stop thinking about it that way. I think that's been everyone... I think that's the... We're... I'm gonna I come. think we're inadvertently playing into the colonial power of the US Because... Like, what, like for example... You're really seriously telling me that a Punjabi dude uh, in Punjab, in 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 uh, in, uh, Amrit, in Amritsar, has more in common with a dude 
like me from Chennai than he does with the guy from Lahore. You're really, you're really making that argument. Or you're telling me that a dude from uh, Vadodara, like from Ahmedabad in Gujarat, really has nothing in common with Karachi, really. You're really making that argument? You're really willing to make that argument? No, I'm willing to bet that, or actually a dude from Kutch. A uh, dude from Kutch has nothing to do with uh, the people in Sindh, really? They're really, they have nothing to do with one another? Like, you have Pakistanis with last name, with the, with the last name Rajput, for God's sakes. Yeah. Like you're really yeah. ma you're really making this argument that Pakistanis and Indians are the are like pure and bitter enemies to the end. And like if you ask an American like why India and Pakistan hate each other or whatever and they'll be like, "Oh, it's probably just like a 5,000-year-old thing." And it's like it's not. It's completely cooked up. It's complete nonsense. And both both the Indian state and the Pakistani state as a whole are literally just post-colonial states that are just trying to wrangle the the various the very diverse populations of Pakistan and India. And the other thing is, Pakistan neither Pakistan and in, in, nor India has an ethnic majority. Neither country does. That's that's particularly why uh, part of the Hindutva message is Hindi Hindu Hindutva, because there is no identity in India that forms a majority. There is no identity in India that outright forms a majority. There's no Hindi speaker identity. That's not a thing. It's a vague, nebulous term that we use to group people that speak Hindi, right? If you actually go back far enough, like most Hindi speakers that we consider to be Hindi speakers now are what? Marwadi speakers, right? They speak like the various languages of Rajasthan. They speak Awadi, they speak Bhojpuri, yeah. they speak Brajbasha, they speak Pahari languages. That's what their actual mother tongue is. It's not Hindi. The, the four most victims of Hindi imposition are North Indians. They're the first victims of, of Hindi imposition, right? Of this uh, fake statecraft that, that, that have been imposed on, that is that this Indian state has been trying to impose on everyone. The four most victims are North India. And that's what polarized that among with this imposition of a national identity is what polarized is partially what polarized the the hindu and muslim uh populations of both india and pakistan it's this imposition of this sort of artificially constructed national identity in both india and pakistan that led to this level of polarization and now we have the situation in india and pakistan where if a muslim gets attacked in india or when a muslim gets attacked in india you'll have the far right of Pakistan chirping and saying, "Ha! This, like, look at what you know. Look at what India is doing. Look at what look at what India is doing to these Muslims. India is not a safe place for Muslims." And then, when these these same idiots attack a Hindu, or when, when they attack Hindus in Pakistan, the far right of India will start chirping and saying, "Ah, see, Pakistan. This is why we needed CAA and RC, right?" Or when something like that happens in Bangladesh, these same far right idiots in India will chirp about the same thing and they'll say, oh, well, this is why we need a uh, Hindutva. This is why we need a Hindu Rashtra. And it is this same idiotic, it's this same idiotic idea of a national identity for Pakistan and India that has led to this level of polarization, right? That has led to this level of fundamentalism capturing both of our countries. It's ridiculous. And, and like, it, like, it's it's funny that like people are surprised that like when Pakistanis visit Tamil Nadu, like Tamil Nadu people are not like as pressed about Pakistan. Like we're like, all right, whatever, dude. Like you're Pakistani, come in. Like we got great biryani, we we got great food. Yeah, I've, I've actually seen uh, North some North Indians uh, actually blame Tamils for being very friendly with Pakistan. You like go to Pakistan stuff like that. Yeah, and it's like we're not. Like, yeah, because we don't believe in the same, like, idiotic nationalism that you fuckers do. Like, we don't believe in the same stuff that you do, right? We have beef with Sri Lanka, but I, 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 would, th I would think that the beef with Sri Lanka that we have is pretty legitimate, actually. But yeah. I would say that's pretty legitimate. But, uh, the, yeah, uh, do you remember the all Hindu thought, uh, the Hindu thought was using all eyes on Rafa picture with all eyes on Hindus in Pakistan? Yeah, and the I, we, I was just talking about it with, uh, my friend Kartik, the the just last night, 
and he he brought this up like these hindutva morons had they done just a tiny bit of googling they would have known that when they did that there was a there was a communal riot against christians in pakistan they would have when they did that there was a lynching of a christian man in pakistan and that the the christian owned stores were being ransacked by far right you know psychos in pakistan had they just done a little bit of research but again it's this same idiotic like i i think the imposition of national identity has provided a very fertile ground for again the far right i think national identities provide a very easy fertile ground for uh um these really far right nationalisms to take place right for whether whether it be like the far right uh islamists of pakistan and the far right pakistani nationalists or whether it be the hindu nationalists of india i think this imposition of a national identity and the neglect of a regional identity is what leads to this sort of decay in democracy it's partially it's one of many things aside from obviously neoliberal reforms and and uh, austerity measures and all of the ills of capitalism again this we're not talking about capitalism for the time being um but it's i think that's partially what leads to this decay i think that's what leads to this decay in what we call in, in what we're, is supposed to be like a somewhat democratic process i think that's why like i, I i'm a huge proponent of regionalism for sure okay another thing i wanted to talk about was what many pakistanis get wrong about pashtuns is mm -hmm. like you said someone in amritsar would have a lot more common with someone in lahore so this also apply, applies in the context of a pashtun living in i don't know kohat or peshawar anywhere in the tribal areas and and he or she would are going to have uh, they're going to have more in common with someone in Afghanistan who speaks Pashto. So they have this sense of harmony, the Pashtuns of Afghanistan and Pakistan. So the way Pakistanis, many Pakistanis see it as like, oh, you're Afghan East agents, you're, you're traitors. So and that's that's how they see the PTM. That's how they see Ali, people like Ali Wazir or Mohsen Tawar or Mansur Pashtin. So it, it, we're just not getting it. I mean, it's it's a simple concept, isn't it? Why Why can't they get it? It's know. it's the same thing with India. So, I mean, who do you think the people of West Bengal are going to have the largest affinity for? It's certainly not Rajasthan. Like, who are they going to be culturally most close with? The people of Bangladesh, because they speak the same exactly. language, right? Yeah. Who is Who are the Tamils going to have the largest affiliation with? Yeah, it's the Tamils of Ceylon. It's the Tamils of, of the island of Sri Lanka or Elam. It's, that's that's who the Tamils are going to have the largest affinity with because we speak the same language, of course, and we share media. Lot, like Plenty of Elam Tamils come to Tamil Nadu to try and make it in, 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 in the acting business, right? Or they come to Tamil Nadu as refugees. Yeah, of course we're going to have a solid, of course we're going to have some form of, uh, you know, cultural, you know, interplay. Uh, it, it's because that's how that works, right? That's how regional identities work. If you, again, the division between Punjab is completely arbitrary. It's like, it's like I said. So, of course, a Pashtun in Pakistan is going to have a lot more in common with other Pashtuns in Afghanistan. Or uh, Baloch people are going to have far more in common culturally with the uh, Baloch people of Iran. Right of uh, Zahidan and, and Sistan Balochistan, why? Well, yeah, that's. I mean, they speak the same language. Of course, they're gonna have it. Like uh, it's called cultural similarities. What do you mean, right? That's like the 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 people of Gilgit Baltistan. Who are their co most common relatives? The people in Ladakh, right? That's their most common. That's their most close. That's their closest relatives. The people of Ladakh, right? Because they're basically the same thing. They're basically this. They're a collection of different ethnic groups, uh, all settled in the mountains. It's very simple. It's not that hard to. It's not that hard a concept to understand. Um, yeah. Like it's like. It. I don't like. Of course, Pashtuns are not going to be Afghanistan. They're not going to be agents of the Taliban. That's fucking insane. 
from what I understand, most yeah. of the uh, Pashtuns in in Pakistan are actually quite progressive, right? Especially the, yeah, those are. in the PTI and and people like Manzoor Pashtin. They're gonna be very progressive, yes, especially especially Manzoor Pashtin and the new uh, political party, the NDM, the National Democratic Movement, by Mohsin Dawood, Afrasiab Khattak, and others. And they're uh, and e even the ANP, uh, mm. they're also very uh, progressive. PTI not so much. But, P I, uh, yeah, PTI are, itself isn't uh, super progressive, but there are many progressives within uh, PTI, yeah. right? There are many progressives within PTI because they see PTI as like, again, they see PTI as a Big Ten party, right? As a as a as a nationally viable party, as opposed to yeah. uh, the other uh, Pashtun parties. Um, yeah, I mean, That's it's true. it's very obvious, like why, like, it's. I don't know, like that that sort of line of questioning of like, oh, do Pashtuns like have loyalty to Afghanistan or Pakistan? No, they have. They just want to preserve their culture. That's the first thing, right? Like, like Pashtu, like they have a they have hundreds of years of literacy. Like, their their most like one of their most important poets, uh, Kushal Khan Katak, right? Like very, yeah. like very, like they have a long tradition of liter like uh, literature of poetry and literature, warrior poets, right? They have a long tradition of that and they want to preserve it, right? They don't they want to preserve it against uh the looming threat of Urdu imposition and and Pakistani national uh ident identitarian imposition, right? Yeah, no part of the world deserves more kind of open borders in South Asia. Yeah, for we've tried this like sectarianism for seven decades and it's been nonsense. Yeah, it like I think the I think the best way, to, I think the best part of the world to understand why like states are just completely arbitrary in their nonsense, aside from Africa itself, right, is is South Asia. Every South Asia, this part of the world, it's pure nonsense, right? The idea of India, the idea of Pakistan as a unified country with some sort of like, uh, you know, as a as a sort of like. Yeah, the like somehow everyone having one thing in common. Okay, ev Pakistan is overwhelmingly majority Muslim, and and now you're still able to find divisions between Shias and Sunnis, and you now have I mean, people it, saying that Ahmadis are not Muslims, or you now have like religious sectarian. Like, where does it end? Like, it doesn't matter how many borders you draw. There's always going to be some way you can discriminate, and you also have you know Punjabi nationalists saying, well, Sarakis are not a real people. Potuars are. Potwaris are not a real Bahari Pot uh, Potwaris are not a real people, or like Pashtuns are terrorists, or Balochis uh, Balo Baloches are terrorists, right? And you know the Balo they'll they'll justify the Baloch genocide or whatever. Where does it end? Where does this Where does this end? Right? Like the only reason I advocate for a two polity solution on Sri Lanka, one for Elam and the other for Sri Lanka, is that it it is a direct counter to settler colonial uh, colonialism. It it stops the settle, the ongoing settler colonialism. It stops the it is a way to stop the ongoing military violence inflicted upon the minorities of Sri Lanka. That's the only reason I advocate for it. It's a direct stopgap solution, right? Yeah. But in the context of Pakistan and India, like how many borders are you like? What are you gonna do? Like who are you going to divide next, right? Yeah. And it's like uh, uh several people in India said one like if you know God forbid. Hindu Rashtra becomes a thing, it's no longer going to be Hindus versus Muslims versus Christians. It's now going to be Brahmin, Kshatriyas, Vaishya, Shudras, and then Dalit people. It's we're going to bring back the caste system. And then or or other than that, now the the center is going to uh, rather than that, you're going to have the center attacking regional identity, saying, Oh, well, you uppity South Indians and you uppity Northeast Indians, you've been errant and you now, you know, here's the full might of North India, and we're going to impose our language on you. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and they call uh, Saraikis as thieves, apparently, which is some nonsense, I guess, like Punjabi nationalists. I've seen uh, Punjabi nationalists call, again, uh, Dani here and along with other Saraikis as, uh, as uh, settlers and Zionists, which is, is wild to me. Uh, I find it incredibly yeah. absurd that people think that. Yeah, um, about the racism, uh, especially... Uh, in these times, uh, some PMLN-backed journalists, there's this guy called Razi Dada, so-called journalist, he's been advocating that 
all Pashtun and Baloch students should be kicked out of universities in Pakistan. I mean, he would like every tweet that says that now likes are private, so good for him. Uh, but he, he he directly says it, and there are other people who say that. Uh, and uh, you already mentioned how you know, but the Pakistanis or the overwhelming majority of Pakistanis they see Pashtuns having loyalties to Afghanistan and Baloch having loyalties to India, or I don't know. Or Iran, or oh, that's another thing. Like uh, the, it's ridiculous. Like, uh, Baloch, Balochistan in Kashmir. Uh, this is a ridiculous thing because Pakistan is. I neither uh, Pakistan does not give a shit about Kashmir, uh, and it, de- it genuinely shows in like their treatment of Azad J and K. They do not give a shit about the people of Kashmir, so they're just posturing when they talk about like the oppression of Kashmiris in in India. And India does not give a flying. They don't care about the people of Balochistan either. They don't care. Of course. It's it's. Yeah. They don't care either. India is just using Balochistan as a cudgel in the same way Pakistan is using Kashmir as a cudgel. It's yeah. the same nonsense. Like it's, it, like I said, India and Pakistan are very. They're mirror images of one another, um, with with some with just a couple of key important differences. That's it, right? It's yeah. they're mere they're near images of one another. They're they're mirror images of one another. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, you make a fair point. I'm really concerned about the rising racism though in Pakistan. Like I was mentioning, mm-hmm. uh, the the hatred being spread against Pashtun and Baloch students. I mean, they're being disappeared by the state. That's another issue. Uh, yeah. But uh, the other problem is. Uh, Apparently, progressive people, uh, educated people, journalists, other professionals, if they're saying things like the, the Pashtuns and Baloch students don't come here to study, they are just here in universities in Punjab to, uh, I don't know, uh, destabilize the university, whatever. It's so bad here. For example, if, uh, for example, the Punjab University in Lahore, it's a huge public sector university. If you want to go there and if the students want to celebrate the Saraiki Culture Day, there's this uh, political party called Jamaat Islami. They come and they just, you know. No, we're familiar with you know. JI. Yeah, JI. And they have this uh, student wing, which I would call a militant student wing called the IJT, the Islamic Jamaat Talba. Thugs is what so, they are. Yeah, so they'd come and. I don't know. They won't allow Pashtun Culture Day. They won't allow Saraiki Culture Day. They won't allow uh, Progressive Students Collective uh, is sort of a new uh, student movement in Pakistan, leftist progressive. Mm-hmm. So they have their study circles. They just you know, sit in circles and have their, I don't know, Mark, Karl Marx books or whatever. <laughs> and, they, 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 and, and, the, the, and the Jamiat, uh, the IJT would come and you know, beat them up. They would beat up the Saraiki. They would beat up the uh, Pashtuns and the Baloch and and there are often violent fights between these groups in public uh, universities in Pakistan. So and uh, and the co- the political commentators they're not helping uh, all, all the venom that they're pitting against the Baloch and Pashtun students. And also uh, another problem nowadays is the Karachi law and order situation that I would like to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Karachi is obviously very unsafe. Uh, a lot of robberies, and uh, if you resist the robbers, they're going to kill you. This is the thing with Karachi. It's very, very common. Every other day, someone's going to die. Uh, the death rate has really gone high uh, recently. So, uh, some of the racist people, who I don't think they represent the people of Karachi, they say things like that all of the robbers are Saraiki. All of the, I mean, recently. They're like, uh, it's the, it's, they're non-Karachiites. They call, they use the word Gair Mukam, someone who, who isn't from the city and has come from outside. So, and now uh, we see uh, the worst kind of racism against Saraikis, even coming from Karachi, which really hurts, you know. Uh, so it's just racism everywhere. Universities, uh, uh Journalists on YouTube, journalists on TV, even in cricket now. So the Pakistani cricket team lost to the US and to India. Who got blamed? Pashtun cricketers. 
someone said that they are just too busy uh, staying at home and praying namaz and just clean pashtoon and they, they don't have exposure that's why pakistan lost so imagine the racism that even if your cricket team loses an ethnicity is going to be blamed so an ethnicity I... gets blamed for terrorism an ethnicity gets blamed for cricket losses an ethnicity gets blamed for uh, problems in university okay it's... i find What's first that? off i find that very stupid because from what i understand most of pakistan's best cricketers are pashtun like yeah like Imran Khan is a great example of it. Imran Khan was a fantastic cricketer. Uh he was what he was yeah. a fast bowler, wasn't he? he all-rounder, yeah. Oh, he was an all-rounder, right? Yeah. Uh and then uh uh Shahid Afridi. Again, another yeah. Pashtun guy, right? Most of a lot of like Pakistan's best uh uh you know the, the, a lot of Pakistan's best cricketers come from KPK. So this is ridiculous first yeah, even even in other sports. Yeah, it, even yeah, in other yeah. sports as well. Like a lot of uh, Pakistan's best sportsmen come from KPK. That's that's ridiculous. Yeah. But I think it goes back to like the point of I think you're yeah, the the rising racism is a particular problem, but I think there's also a solution here in the sense that uh I think when you politicize when you mobilize and and create these you know political movements of basically addressing long standing grievances with the state right Baloch, like for example the baloch's long standing uh, grievances with the state are you've been disappearing us for the past like 30 you know several decades or so and you've been um you've been you've been indiscriminately killing us you've been blaming the bla and all of these uh you know Baloch national militant groups for for uh, killing us, um, and it led to the point where you have figureheads like Marang Baloch basically saying, you know, we've had enough. We've had enough of this. We're going to march on Islamabad, and uh, we're going to do. You know, we're actually going to do something about it, right? Yeah. Um, Pashtuns have been absolutely used by the state, and they have been bombed by the state left and right. But I think that's why. You see a huge, especially in recent days, you see a huge assertment, uh, uh, assertion of Pashtun identity because they've had enough. They've had enough of the abuse that the Pakistani state has committed against the Pashtun people. And I think, I think this presents a really good opportunity for people to mobilize. And I think it presents a really good opportunity to say, well, we're, we've had enough. Like... We have our own. We have our own stuff to be proud of. We have our own sort of uh, identities to be proud of. Whether you're Muhajir, whether you're Saraiki, whether you're, um, uh, whether you're Pashtun, whether you're Baloch, Brahui, whatever it may be, you have your own identity to be proud of, right? And uh, you know, we're not gonna, you know, Chitrali, whatever it may be, we have our own identity, uh, identity to be proud of, and we're not gonna take this crap anymore. We're not gonna take the the sort of slop that the media gives us right we're not going to take the abuse that the media gives us saying like oh saraikis are all robbers or pashtuns are lazy or they're terrorists or baloch people are you know sympathetic to india we're, we're done with that nonsense right we're done with this nonsense we're going to mobilize even further and yeah. i think what's and again, I want to bring this back to Saraiki Vaseb a little bit. And the reason I think Saraiki Vaseb presents a really pivotal moment, the demand for Saraiki Vaseb, is that a lot of what we consider to be regional movements were confined to what would be considered the frontier regions of Pakistan, like Balochistan and KPK. Those are considered like frontier regions of Pakistan. So it's kind of, and, and even like JNK and, and Gilgit Baltistan, like those are considered very frontier regions. They're not considered the interior of Pakistan. But Multan... Yeah. Multan is mm -hmm. is the interior of Pakistan. It is with yeah, it is right very in the, right, right in the center. It's right in the center. It's close to the core of Pakistan. So, yeah. generally speaking, at least at least the way when we talk about Pakistan, we consider it to be we consider Eastern Pakistan to just be, I guess, the most quote unquote Pakistani of the bunch, right? Whether it be Punjab or Sindh, we consider it to be the most stereotypically Pakistani of the bunch, and there haven't been as much of like a regional push because Sindh has its own like region it has its own province and uh Punjab has its own provincial government. 
So there haven't been as many regional movements in this region either, in, in these two provinces yeah. either. But if, you know, Saraiki Vasev and, and all this, this movement for Saraiki, uh, you know, region were to really kick off, I think what's really going to happen, I think what's going to happen is that you are going to see if, I think you, it has the potential to have a, a, you know, a sort of domino effect in that you really will begin to see other people chime in and say like, hey, wait a minute, what about us? Or, hey, what about us? Right? What about our yeah. Potuari identity? And then you'll begin to see an overall push for, I guess, regionalism against the the forced fed narrative of the unified Pakistani unitary state. Also, yeah, people are... People, what's up? Sorry, go ahead. People get so, why do people get so paranoid about it? Like, they are, we talk, like you're talking about how uh, the autonomy of the strike you will say will give rise to momentum in other uh, ethnicities. So I feel like someone will listen to this and be like, oh, they're going to try, they're trying to break Pakistan, this Arun guy. Uh, yeah, no. Why? Why is, why is this Donnie Maybe Darko? Why is this Donnie Darko guy talking to a raw agent? Uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. No, I actually I, said that. You know, someone actually said that to me. Like you're talking to an Indian. Yeah. Well, I'm telling him? you, as an, I'm him? telling you what I'm telling you, India's greatest success is. I'm I'm telling you, this is why this is what makes India, uh, like this is what it, this is India's secret formula. I'm literally giving you India's secret formula and I'm giving you like the best thing about India. Because the thing is, the reason that India hasn't completely fallen apart quite yet, if you, and this is also not considering the Northeast for the record, right? The Northeast hasn't seceded, like they've been trying to secede from India for quite a while. It's just that the Indian army has completely crushed them, right? So that's a different, that's another can of worms I don't want to open, right? But um, no, if we're talking about mainland India, right? Uh, I like, no, it's, it's partially because that the Tamils, uh, the Tamil regional identity, like if you go to Tamil Nadu right now and you ask them, Hey, should, do you think we should separate from India? 95, 99% of them will say no. Why is that? It's because they have enough autonomy. I mean, obviously it's not perfect. We obviously still have issues with the government. We still have issues with Indian position. We still have issues of you know, our, you know, us paying way more in taxes than we get, in, you know, back from the center. There are lots of grievances that we have with the government. But if you ask a Tamil person in India, hey, do you think that we would want to separate from, from India? And nine times out of 10, they'll say, no, of course not. What are you talking yeah. about? And it's partially yeah, due to the- here. Yeah. Same here. Yeah, it's the same thing. They're not asking, like- uh, a similar thing is happening with Manipur, actually, because uh, the Maite nationalists in Manipur are basically trying to brand the Kukis, the Kukizo people who want a separate administration within India as separatist, right? But that's not true. They just want a separate administration in India. They, they still want to be part of India. They just want a separate administration, right? Um, and it's because there is a negotiation that the Indian state has managed to strike wherein the, the regional populations that have their own distinct identity are somewhat okay with the arrangement because they get most of, they get a lot of what they want. Not most of what they want, but they get a decent amount of what they want. They get to retain their cultural identity. They get domain over what kind of, how the funds are allocated. There's a level of autonomy given, right? There's a, so it, it's, what I'm telling you in terms of like, hey, Saraiki Vasev is a good idea. It's not because I want Pakistan to break apart. It is the solution I'm giving you is ironically what is going to save Pakistan. It is ironically yeah. what is going to save Pakistan. It is what it like Pakistan is already like falling apart at the seams right now. Right. But the solution that I'm giving you, which is the, uh, the development and the advocacy and the championing of regional identities, such as Saraiki Wasay, Pashtunistan, uh, Balochistan, uh, you know, and these various other, like, and the championing of, like, hey, mother tongue language first schools, like Saraiki first schools, Pashtun, Balochi, you know, Pashto schools, Balochi first schools, these Brahui first schools, that is going to preserve 
is that is going to let, I mean, this idea of a state is already kind of dead on arrival to begin with. It's kind of a zombie institution to begin with. But federalism and regionalism is what can often prolong the life of that state. India has been a zombie state since 1947. The fact that it is alive, that it is still together, is, is a minor miracle. And the reason that it has managed to stay together is because there's been a constant negotiation between the various regional identities of India and, and the center. There has been a constant negotiation. There's been constant battles, obviously. And, and there's still, like, we still have to, you know, there's still a long way to go. But it is, I think India's federalism situation is significantly better than federalism in the rest of the subcontinent. That's for sure. I, and I think that is, that is what has allowed India to, to at least, you know, because, and again, it's also used as a talking point in India, unity and diversity, right? It allows India to just go around and say, hey, listen, we have, you know, X hundred languages, like 200, 300, some odd hundred languages spoken in our borders, right? We are an incredibly diverse country. You know, you go to Uttarakhand, it's not going to be, it's a mountainous area, right? But you go to Tamil Nadu, it's like, you know, very hot, very, you know, beachy sort of area, right? You know, coastal area, right? You go to Chennai, it's very, you know, it's, it's all over the place, right? Yeah. I think the development of regional identities in Pakistan and the nurturing of regional identities in Pakistan will single-handedly, uh, I think it's going to help the people of Pakistan in the long term. And I think it will slowly begin to tear down these walls that both the Indian state apparatus and the Pakistani state apparatus have built. Because again, we're not that different. We're, I mean, well, I mean, you and I are very different because we come from very different regions of, of, of this subcontinent. But, uh, but the thing is like, we're like subcontinental, uh, subcontinental people as a whole are not that different from one another. We're, we're genuinely not. And I think the only way for people yeah. to realize that is to focus less on the national angle and to focus on like, hey, hold on a second. I'm Saraiki first. And then, you know, if you want Pakistani second, I'm Tamil first. And then I'm Indian second, right? I'm Pashtun first, Baloch first, Brahui first, uh, you know, Burushaski, Burusho first. You know, I'm this identity first. I'm, I'm Balti first. And then, you know, whatever national identity. Right? And there's I think, nothing wrong with saying that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with saying that. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Like, that's yeah, how most Tamils operate, by the way. You, yeah, if you say this in Pakistan, I mean, you're, you're the bad guy. No, if you, I mean, again, if you say this in India, especially North India, you're also the bad guy. But, like, Tamils have gotten enough autonomy where we can just say that and we don't, no one gives a shit. No one cares. Yeah. We've gotten enough, we've negotiated enough autonomy like again think about the contrast between think i mean think about the contrast between the tamils of of india where they've negotiated some level of autonomy and the tamils of of the elam tamils who are mostly like i hate sri lanka <laughs> i hate sri lanka like they they like i hate these guys like i hate the government like these guys do not give me any level of autonomy there is no such thing as like you have like uh you know the legislative assemblies in Pakistan and in India, they they ha they technically have that in Sri Lanka, but it, they're useless. They they cannot do anything, right? It's all directly controlled by the center in Sri Lanka. So and and there's a straight ongoing military occupation among many other things. So Elam Tamils despise the government. They hate the government, right? And they want nothing to do with it. And it's because there has not been a decent negotiation between that population and the government, because the government is, again, the, the Sri Lankan government is basically the Israel of, of, of South Asia, if I'm going to be honest. It's very identical, basically. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, I, I think that in Pakistan, I think one of the best ways of countering this national narrative is, is through the development of regional politics. And, I, and it gets to the broader point of, like, I think progressives in India and Pakistan need to stick together. Like... Because yeah. like, because the the narrative has already been captured uh, by the far right of both Pakistan and India. I think we have no other choice but to stick together as progressives. There's no other way of doing it because like, because what's gonna happen, right? It, like, it's like it's the feedback loop that I was talking about earlier. Like, you have 
the far right in Pakistan weaponizing the uh, atrocities against Muslims in India, right? And then you have the far right in India weaponizing the atrocities committed against Hindus in Pakistan. So, like, we, we've already entered that feedback loop where, you know, you have these people yelling at each other and, and, uh, and the progressive voices have already been drowned out. I hope and I pray that the ruling class in Pakistan understand the significance of uh, the regional movements here. What was it? If Pakistan is to it, 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 if Pakistan is to exist and prosper, it has to re redefine itself. And then my Pakistani chatter, Karachi chatter, uh, uh, comes in. Pakistan government would rather let the country sink than do that. Not just Pakistani government, but majority of Pakistani people. Uh, Jesus Christ, that's kind of sad. Jesus Christ. But no, I I like I like to have po I like to have hope. Like I think that. Um, I, I want to hold out hope for, for, for Pakistan. Like, I think Pakistan is capable of, of changing course, just like, uh, just like India is. That's a big statement. Aaron. No, I, I, I think people, I mean, people are people at the end of the day and people yeah. are at the end of the day, they're going to be in tune to what's, you know, for example, like, uh, if, if Sarakis are putting are struggling to put food on the table because the you know they're not getting enough you know uh, support from the government, they're gonna keep that in mind. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna keep that in mind and they're gonna realize that and they're gonna get mad and they're gonna keep, uh, they're going to keep they're <laughs> they're gonna get angry, and uh, and and I think that anger is righteous. And I think that anger needs to be channeled against the Pakistani state narrative. I think that, right? Yeah. I I think it's a I think it's a very important thing to keep in mind. I I agree. I really have high hopes from people like Manzoor Pashtin, the PTM overall, Maran Baroj, the Baloch of Jati Committee. Uh, I don't really I, even uh, one thing I'd like to mention here. There's this uh, very good university in Islamabad called the Qaeda Azam University. Yes, and uh, they have uh, this uh, Saraiki Students Council. I think they're doing a brilliant job. I'm really, really impressed. I really want to go meet them and you know be a part of their campaigns. So uh, uh, the Kailasam University is kind of uh, progressive, so you cannot go and have holy there. It's not like Punjab University. So uh, I'm really impressed by those young people. Uh, I think they give me hope. Yeah, and, and I, the thing I, is, I, sorry to cut you off. The thing is, like, yeah, the thing that I've seen is, like, uh, you have, you know, Pakistanis that are celebrating. I mean, Holi is not something that I celebrate to begin with because, again, that's a North Indian holiday. But, like, uh, yeah, they like they are, it, they're demonstrating their desire for, you know, inclusivity and they're de demonstrating a desire for a better, like, society. And, whether I mean I I personally don't care for like the the I, the states of India or Pakistan, but I care about improving the society. I care about improving yeah. the, you know the, like I I care about improving the society we both live in. Like, and I think there's a lot of hope in Pakistan. Uh, I think the other thing is there just has to be internet. I mean, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the things it's just that the 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 international left doesn't know the real situation in Pakistan. They don't know the ground level situation in India. They don't know anything about Sri Lanka for that for for, for that for that matter. And what do they know about what? Do they know anything? I mean, they're pretty much useless. Uh, I mean, there are takes about pocket. I mean, it's basically like. Every, like the Western left's perspective on Pakistan is basically like how the U.S. fucked up in Pakistan, and that's about it, right? They don't yeah. really know the actual internal dynamics of Pakistan. They don't know anything about it. They're just like, if you ask a, a, a leftist in the West what a Pashtun is, they'd be like, I don't know. Like they'd ask them like what a if you ask them like what a Baloch person is and 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 what like the Baloch genocide is. Most of them would be like, "What the fuck? Well, like, what are you talking about? They don't, they don't know anything, yeah. right?" And India, they, I mean, most Americans about India, they just know triple R. That's it. <laughs> like, yeah. they don't know anything. 
I have had, I have had, oh God, throughout this entire election, I was pulling my hair out because even Al Jazeera got the election predictions wrong. And I, once I, once the election predictions were, oh, I had called the election results like about a month or two in advance. And I've been saying like, no, Modi's going to lose his majority. Like BJP is going to lose his majority or like they're going, it's not going to be a comfortable victory for them. I had said that going into the election about a month or two in. I was like, this is not as comfortable a victory. And then everyone was saying, oh, Modi's going to win. Modi's going to win. Modi's going to comfortably win. Modi's going to comfortably win. And I was like, you guys do not know what you're talking about, please. Even Al Jazeera was, uh, you know, just counting it as like a, a foregone conclusion that Modi was going to win. I was like, where, you guys are a reputable organization. How are you guys flubbing this? This is ridiculous. So I, I think there's a genuine lack from the West. I think there's a lack of understanding from the West regarding this region. Uh, Sri Lanka, they don't know anything. <laughs> just, just, I'm putting yeah. it out there. They, they know. No one knows anything about Sri Lanka. They, no one, I, I would make the, I would make the, I would make the statement that most people in the subcontinent don't, don't know anything about Sri Lanka. Most people in this region itself don't like even people in South India didn't know much about Sri Lanka before I told them. Right. Hmm. So most people don't know and about even that. Even people, even people in Lahore don't know what Saraiki is. People in Lahore, which is like three hours from Sultan, they don't know what Saraiki is. They're like, well, what's Multan? Is it a village? Well, we've heard about Multan. Okay. What's Saraiki? What's that language? And they obviously don't know about the blue genocide. Uh, yeah, because they're incredibly uh, privileged. I mean, yeah, and also the Pakistani state won't allow people to know it. It can't be talked about in mainstream media, and uh, they want to. They banned Twitter. We're using VPNs, and uh, now I'm hearing about some firewall, which is gonna control VPNs or something. I don't know. They're trying to. Uh, um, I don't know, get something from China and try to try to learn how to, uh, you know, stop people from using uh, social media apps and and then malign the state institutions and the new Punjab defamation law. Oh my god, that's. I mean, you. I don't know if you read about that. It's horrible. I mean, you don't even have to prove that someone's been been defamed. <laughs> It's a horrible law, and it's Wonderful. basically uh, just focuses on the army chief or the, I don't know, the chief justice or other uh, senior positions. So there's this uh, lawyer and a political commentator called Reema Omar. She's she's brilliant. Mm -hmm. She comes on Geo TV. Geo TV. She was uh, talking about a, a very old case in the U.S. where someone went to the court and uh, said that uh, some public official. Uh, said something about defamation and they were like even if the journalist or someone who's published news against you you as an pub you as a public official you have a certain degree of responsibility so if they if they did not do it on purpose we're not going to punish them so in pakistan like if you say something and you can't prove it you're gone you said something about a general or a judge or someone very powerful and for some reason, I mean, you, you, you won't, you're not lying on purpose. You're not uh, spreading misinformation on purpose. You're not, uh, you know, spreading disinformation on purpose. But somehow you got something wrong. And somehow, for some reason, you can't reveal your source or you just can't prove it. You're, you're behind bars. You're in prison. So this new Punjab defamation law is horrible. Jesus. That's, that's actually awful. Yeah, things are getting worse. So I'm gonna some some people like me and we're just counting on brave Pashtun and Baloch nationalists to put some pressure on the government because the Saraiki movement is quite weak at the moment. Uh, but like you said, progressives in India and Pakistan need to stick together, and progressives in Pakistan need, need to stick together for, for the love of God. Uh, I want people of Karachi to talk to people of Multan, and please, Lahori progressives, please <laughs> listen to us. Yeah, lo Give yeah. Us some some Saraiki nationalists tell me that why are you pleading Lahoris? They're not going to help you. Just, you know, they maybe they're right. I don't know. They keep telling me that, you know, read books, uh, upgrade your knowledge, uh, learn, engage with people of, from your own community, uh, mm -hmm. build your own movement. No one's, no one from Lahore is going to help you. Don't rely on leftist progressives of Lahore. 
uh, I mean, I don't know. But I, what I think is, I think everyone needs to come together. It's nonsense. I, I think numbers are the most important thing. You need numbers. You need, you need, yeah. you need a huge alliance, and you need a huge coalition behind you. Like that's yeah, with everyone, with Pashtuns, with Balots, with people of Karachi, the Majors, with uh, with Kashmiris. I think uh, I don't. Yeah, because all parties conference or something where, where uh, people come together with their grievances and they talk to each other and you know build a uh, momentum. I don't know. I mean, if you even if you can't like make it, even if you can't make it like uh, physically, you can always like find places to like talk about it online. You can always like communicate yeah. online, you know. Yeah. There, even if you can't make the distance, because it is like again, Pakistan is a huge country. So even if you can't do it, yeah. there's always a. You can always uh, talk over like I get. Oh yeah, that's right. Telegrams banned in Pakistan too. Jesus, <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. forgot about that. Uh, I, I was gonna be like, I, hey, I, let's let's just make a telegram and then chat there. And I'm like, oh, that's right. That's also banned in Pakistan. <laughs> Very stupid. I'm, I'm wondering what's next. I they can't possibly ban WhatsApp. That's crazy. They all didn't they? Okay, they used to ban TikTok. They they banned TikTok yeah. and then they removed it, right? For They're, a while, yeah, they banned TikTok for a while for obscenity and vulgarity or something. Oh, okay. Well, at least you have a. I mean, at least TikTok's not banned in Pakistan like it is in India. So. I mean, we have yeah. our, the reason we banned TikTok is because China. <laughs> That's oh, it. I forgot. Yeah. I we forgot. banned TikTok because China. Banned yeah. In India. Yeah. 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 It's like, okay. Ridiculous. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know. Like I, like I said, I think there is fertile ground for uh, progressive movements in Pakistan. And I think there's a way you can, I think there's a way to turn Pakistan around. Cause again, I want, again, when I talk, when I come on this show, I don't, just care about like the people of india obviously right i don't just want indians to thrive i want the people of the subcontinent to thrive because again yeah. the thing is once we come to the u.s right or once like the diaspora comes to the u.s we're in the same boat i uh, like we there is no uh americans are not educated enough to basically tell the difference between any of us so we're just brown so yeah like in America, we in the United States or in the West, we know how to stick together because we don't have any other option. Because it's either this or we both individually face like anti like anti brown like white racism, and we can't like we don't know what else to do about it, right? So uh, that's why like you'll have lots of six in the United States when when Muslims are attacked and and they get attacked, they never say they're not Muslim or anything like that because they're like, well, hold on a second. We got to stick together. It doesn't matter, right? So, yeah, yeah it's the same thing here. Like, uh, progressives of the subcontinent have to stick together, for sure. I, I 100% okay. agree with that. Uh, pro yeah. Progressives of uh, India and Pakistan have to stick together, for, for, for sure. There's no doubt about it. Um, otherwise, like, uh, I mean, India has not solved its fascism, right? We haven't gotten, we haven't marginalized fascism to the point where it's an irrelevant ideology, right? And in Pakistan, it's all over the place, right? And still, we have the BJP running India, obviously, still. But in Pakistan, it's all over the place, unfortunately. You have religious sectarianism and you have, you know, far-right, you know, you know, state nationalism as, as well as far-right uh, religious fundamentalism in Pakistan as well. Like, it's all over the place. And the only way of combating that is through a united progressive movement. And many of the ways that that can, the way that you can start building that sort of movement is through the building of these regional identities. It's through the building of federal, uh, of federalism, um, yeah. and the demanding of things. Like I said, uh, sort of the the demanding of construction of schools, or the, even like you don't even have to go straight through the government. Just, if you want to, like, if you want to, like, teach kids this you know your language or your culture just do it like you have like community sessions yeah. on the side or whatever just do it right yeah the psyches um, have done it actually the psyches have yeah. done so much i'm actually very proud of them they there's yeah so much literature is being produced in strike i mean when you when you look at it you feel like oh it's a poor province people are educated but they write so many books uh there are so many poets uh 
there's been work on the language itself, uh, the history of the language, and uh, and the linguistic aspect as well. So I'm actually very proud of uh, the the literary uh, works that have been produced, and it's ongoing and it's brilliant. Everyone, I mean, the Sindhis, the Pashtuns, everyone's. Uh, obviously, the state's not gonna do much. So you're right. We have to, you know, take things under our hands and, uh, you know, uh, contribute. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's how. I think it's through this mobilization of these regional identities that can provide a a bulwark. I think it it provides a great counter to to the Pakistani state narrative, because again, yeah. it, the same thing, the the same formula worked in India, and I think it can work in Pakistan. It's ironic, and again, to, to all the criticisms of of Pakistanis that are going to be like, "Well, you're this, you're talking to an Indian dude that's trying to destroy Pakistan. He's a raw agent. He's this. He's that." First off, Indians accuse me of being Pakistani, of being like a Pakistani agent. So I can't win either uh, way. Have like, you been Have you been accused of being in like an ISI agent or something? No, not. I mean. They've they, no, they've called me like Muslim bootlicker. Actually, they've called me Sipoy because I've basically said, uh, hey, maybe we shouldn't impose Hindi on Tamil Nadu. So they called me an agent of the British, which is a lovely, lovely thing. Fantastic. Um, you know, it's great. It's great to be called that sort of thing. Um, no, I, I, I agree. I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, no, I, I agree. I think the best thing is to develop federalism and to develop regional identities. I think that's because I think if you because the ultimate principle behind all of this, right? And the reason and, and if we're really examining what regionalism actually does at a at a at a governance level and at a political level, what the development of regional identity does is, is it it takes power away from the central state. It takes power away from the central government and distributes it, which is what we want, right? We, that's ultimately what the, like, we were talking about, you know, what is the means of, you know, the really, you know, the regional identities, Saraki identities, Balochi identities, what, it, what why, why is it like a short, shortcut? Because what it actually does is building those movements distributes power away from the center and into these, you know, it, it distributes it into these uh, multiple power centers, right? It basically decentralizes power. That's what these regional identities do, ultimately at their very core. That's the benefit of it, right? So it actually stabilizes. It yeah, Sanghi zero in yeah. Actually, first off, they call me out for being Tamil. First off, so that's they're like, oh, you're Tamil Dravidian, you know, you know, idiot or whatever, you know, lemur, whatever, you know. And then they'll just drop the N-word on me, you know, whatever, casual. Um, but going back to this, going back to the other topic, I think that, um, I think what federalism does is it wrests power away from the state and it distributes it. And so the sort of monopoly, the problem that you have in Pakistan is a monopolization of power by the state, right? And I think yeah. ultimately in order for the society to become more stable, you actually have to distribute power. That's actually how society is very much stabilized. You can either go the China route, which is basically, yeah. you know, completely centralize all the power, right, to some extent, which is not, again, it's oversimplifying how China works because, again, you have a sense of regionalism, but there's still overwhelmingly hot nationalism in China, right? There's still, so there's still a, a huge level of centralization in China. Or you can stabilize, I mean, and it's not to say that China isn't stable either way. Right. But what I'm saying is like in this sort of situation, you can stabilize a situation like Pakistan or in India by distributing power away from the center. And ironically, this is a great way to keep uh, to, you know, this is a great way to help the stabilize a society. Right. So yeah. that's what regional identities do. They there are a means to wrestle away power from the center. Right. So the 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 resurgence of a Bojpuri identity, the resurgence of a Awadhi identity, the resurgence of of Brajbash identity in India, what that serves to do is it serves to take power away from you know the center and distribute it among the communities. 
that's what the real means to the end. That's what the real end is, right? That's why developing regionalism is super important because it, it distributes that power. Yeah. I don't know, Arun, uh, talking to you makes me hopeful. I do that to people. I do that to a lot of people. Uh, yeah, how, much, how much time do you have? Do you have? Uh, I have... Uh, I can go. I mean, I can. This is your show. I can go as long as you want. If you have to go soon, I have like, I have like ten fifteen minutes. So we got. uh, uh, I wanted to ask you about Sri Lankan elections. Is is there a date now? Yeah, it's supposed to happen. I mean, they haven't fixed the date yet. Uh, it's supposed to happen in October, September, October, basically, and uh. uh the it's useless uh the, the sri lankan elections yeah. are absolutely useless they're useless they're they don't do anything yeah they're completely useless uh kind of, kind of like pakistani elections nowadays let's be honest you do that most you do that to south asians people outside the subcontinent look at the facts you state and go huh i don't know what you mean by that uh moderator i don't know what you mean by that nerd uh uh, but, uh, that's, yeah. So basically, yeah. Like the thing is like the Sri Lankan elections are, are, are completely useless because the four main parties, let's, let's think about who's running, right? Rhino Vikramasinghe is the current president. Uh, he's the, he's the head of the UNP and he's, he's Runil. Runil has a track record of, you know, just being a gross neoliberal, you know, pro austerity measures kind of guy. So he's not great for the country either. Uh, another alternative is a breakaway from the UNP called the SJV. And he's led it by this, and, he, and that party is led by um, the son of a former president, Rana Singh of Premadasa. Uh, his name is Sajid Premadasa. And th- that party is just kind of like a Nepo Babies party, kind of in a sense. Like, it's just like a Napo Babies party, like exactly what you would expect. The third party that's going to run is SLPP, which is Mahindra Rajapaksa's party. I don't think I need to explain how disastrous... Yeah. I don't think I need to explain how that would go. And then the fourth party is the JVP, Janata Vimukti Permuna. And these guys are the the the, Marxist, the largest communist party in Sri Lanka. And uh, I say communist... Because they're really just Sinhalese nationalists, uh, just using Marxist language. That's basically it. And it does not matter. It really does not matter because the only issues they ever talk about are basically issues relevant to the south of the country, the Sinhalese dominated portions of the country. They do not, like, every now and then they'll say, hey, we'll implement the 13th Amendment that. India held us at gunpoint to create in the first place that we literally had to have like, it, like there's an amendment in the Sri Lankan constitution that only exists to give some level of autonomy to the Tamils of Sri Lanka, the 13th amendment yeah. to the constitution. And the only reason yeah. that exists is because India quite literally threatened to go to war with Sri Lanka. That's the only yeah, reason that it exists. And it's not even because mm-hmm. India did it out of the goodness of their heart. They were just very mad that at the time, Jayawardena's government was aligned with the U.S. and they were spying on India and the USSR. That is the only reason that they're actually, they were actually very mad at Sri Lanka. It's not because they cared about the Tamils. They certainly do not. Um, they did it just to be like, hey, like, don't test our patients. And part of that was they forced Sri Lanka's hand to you know, add this 13th Amendment saying, hey, you know, give you have to set up these provincial councils for each and every single one of the provinces. Power cannot be, you know, in the center of the country. That cannot, that cannot be the, it cannot be just in the center of the country. Uh, you have to. Tamil has to be the official language. It took Sri Lanka got independence in 1948. They signed that in the 1990s. It took nearly 40 years for Tamil to read the other major language of the island to reach parity with. Singhalese with the Singhala language. It took 40 years for that to happen. And it happened because India held them at gunpoint to do it. But so you'll now have some politicians bring up the 13th Amendment saying, oh, we'll fully implement it. 
what is the 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 part of the implementation that's lacking still? Land devolution, police, the devolution of land and policing. So there are supposed to be dis, like provincial ver, like provincial levels of police because the police operates at a federal level, uh, at a central level in Sri Lanka. That what? still hasn't been implemented yet. Yeah, it's it's there is no like there's no equivalent to like the Jaffna Police Department, right? They're like Jaffna Police Department. I mean, there is, but they're effectively part of the Sri Lankan police, right? It's all centralized, right? So effectively, yeah, and the land is not controlled by the uh, provinces either, which means that Tamil land is now like the, the, the land of the minorities is now directly controlled by the Sri Lankan state, by the Sinhalese national Sri Lankan state. So those two haven't been implemented. So now you'll have people that come up every now and then saying, Oh, we'll implement the 13th Amendment someday, uh, which is not going to happen. It's just a way for them to try and garner Tamil votes, which is not like Tamils at this point know like they're they're full of it. Like the, the, the politicians are full of it. AKD, on the other hand, the Communist Party said, listen, we cannot think about the past. We have to think forward as a country. Now, the JVP, which is supposed to be a leftist party, was so angry that the Sri Lankan government tried to distribute aid to the uh, victims of the 2005 tsunami who were predominantly Tamil because the, the government had to negotiate with the LTTE to distribute aid. They were so angry at that that they threatened to walk out of the coalition and they managed to pressure the government into basically making sure that aid does not go into the Tamil and Muslim-dominated portions of the Northeast. So they managed to lobby the government to the point where it was like the Tamils didn't get all that much aid. They didn't get the aid that they need. 30,000 people died as a result of that tsunami, for the record. 30,000 people died. And the JVP was like, instead of helping these people, let's screw these people over. And the JVP has ever been hostile to the Tamils since the 1980s. They basically said, no, the Tamils do not have the right to, to self-determination. They do not have the right to their own separate state. And uh, they and the JVP were, again, this is supposed to be a leftist party, but they are ostensibly, were, they were one of the largest cheerleaders of the war crimes. And they were actually like one of the cheerleaders of uh, an operation that the Sri Lankan Special Task Force did against Muslims in order to try and stir up tensions between, so basically the Sri Lankan government murdered 10 Muslim laborers and blamed it on the LTTE to try and basically divide the Tamils and Muslims living in Ampara district even further. Now, luckily, the Muslims living there were like, what the hell? No, it does not make any sense. The LTTE couldn't have come in here. This entire region is controlled by the Sri Lankan government. So it does not make any sense, right? So they caught onto it immediately and said they demanded an investigation. And then the Sri Lankan government was like, piss off. And the sole survivor of that attack, where like uh, 10 people died, right? They basically just let him rot basically for the rest of his life. And this dude is a tsunami victim. Like this Muslim dude was a tsunami victim, right? He's living in a hut, right? They're using like saris and, and, and salwar kamizas to, as like walls for the hut, right? This dude is not doing great. And he was attacked by the government in like a false flag attempt to blame the Tamils and stir communal tensions, right? And there's been, by the way, there's not even so much been, in, there's not even been as much of a, an investigation into the matter, right? No one has done anything about it. No one's done anything about it. And it's just, it just remains like, oh yeah, Sri Lankan government did an oopsie here, you know? So like the, the, the Sri Lankan government is, is, uh, the, the Sri Lankan elections are a complete waste of time. And they don't do anything. They do not fundamentally change anything. Like, when the, the Aragalea happened two years ago, uh, people were hopeful that things were going to really change for Sri Lanka. And it didn't. Because the guy that was selected to be the prime minister is now the current president. And Rano Vikramasinghe has been prime minister five times at this point. He's been prime minister five times. He's, a, he's part of the old guard, right? He got his first job as, uh, as I think, deputy foreign uh, minister 
under Jayawardena's administration. His uncle was a former president. The current president's uncle was the former president of Sri Lanka, was, was a former president of Sri Lanka. So we haven't even talked about the nepotism angle of it because Sri Lanka, I think out of all the countries in South Asia, has the worst nepotism problem. It has the worst by far. So the entirety of Sri Lanka has been controlled basically by three to four families. That's it. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less, right? You have the Bandaranaike family, the, the Senanaike, Jawardena, Vikramasinghe family, which is basically three married uh, families in one. And then you have the Rajapaksa family. And by the way, Mahinda Rajapaksa was able to become a president at some point, mainly due to the fact that his father was one of the founders of the party he was originally a part of. Don Alwyn Rajapaksa, who is Mahinda Rajapaksa's father, was the founder of the SLFP alongside, uh, you know, Solomon SWRD Bandaranaike, right? That's how. It's just, it's, Sri Lankan elections are a mess. They're not worth anything. There's, there's nothing to report that is meaningful. I am, I am sorry to say this, especially as Suddenly. like... Suddenly, I feel better about Pakistan. No, that's what that's. I was about to say that when we were talking about Pakistan. Be thankful you're in Pakistan and not Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is an order of magnitude worse than India or Pakistan. I am sorry to say this. Like, and and Sri Lankans will get mad at me when I say this. Sri Lanka, like Pakistanis, have this. Uh, they they often say that they are the the Israel of South Asia, and it's a very superficial comparison in that. You know, both Israel and, and Pakistan were founded on the basis of religion. But if you look at Pakistan and Israel structurally, they're very different. They're quite different, right? But if you look at Sri Lanka and Israel, and you look at the history of both of those countries, it is damn near identical. They are both settler colonial countries. They are settler colonial countries to the T, Right? The, it's not just the Tamils that the Sri Lankan state has screwed over. They, like I said, like I just mentioned, they have Syri they have on, they have multi, they have repeatedly killed Muslims, just for political points, by the way, even just for political points to stir communal tension, uh, communal tensions. They have done this before, right? They have also forcibly placed the indigenous Veda population onto reservations. That is, um, that is stuff that America has done. That is stuff that the United States has done, for the record. They have basically done Trail of Tears style forcible repatriation and resettlement onto reservations of indigenous people just like America and Canada have. For the record, they, the same thing, right? And also, there's a small Telugu population on the island. The Sri Lankan... Home Guards, which are another arm of the state, basically committed a massacre of a tiny minority. It's not just the Tamils. It's not just the Muslims. It's not even just the Vedas. Even the Telugus of the island, who are like 4,000 at most, are not safe. It does not matter. You are, if you are not Sinhala Buddhist, you are not safe on that island. There is no question about it. You are constantly under threat. Malayaga Tamils, we will talk about the condition of the Malayaga Tamils tomorrow. They have been, like, their labor has continually been exploited. They are slaves, basically. So the Elam Tamils are the Tamils of the north and eastern coast, right? The Malayaga Tamils are the Indian Tamil laborers that were brought in from India by the British to work the tea plantations. And they're slaves. They're basically slaves. Their labor rights are basically nil at this point. They are... They work tea plantations owned by Singhalese and even Tamil landlords, right? They and and they don't have any labor rights whatsoever. They get chum change and they're forced to live on those particular plantations. It is set, it is uh, indentured servitude basically. And throughout, I didn't even mention this in the documentary because this is a that's another that's for another video. The Malayaga Tamils had their citizen uh, citizenship stripped, so they were stateless for seventy years. They didn't have citizenship for 70 years. The, like the amount of nonsense that Sri Lanka has gotten away with 
just undetected, is insane. It is unbelievable, right? So that's why, like, I am not nearly as enthusiastic. And the thing is, like, the reason I brush off, like, Sri Lanka's elections as, like, oh, this is bullshit. It's complete nonsense. It does not matter whatsoever is because all of the parties ultimately come from the same old guard. That includes the JVP, right? It does not matter. Nothing is fundamentally going to change. The only thing that's going to change if the JVP gets into power is that the United States might start, you know, chirping about, like, human rights violations that Sri Lanka has committed. That's it. And that's going to make everything even worse. That's the only thing that's going to fundamentally change. Nothing is going to fundamentally change about Sri Lanka if JVP gets into power. Nothing is. It's it's wow. like, for the Tamils at least, for the minorities, nothing is going to fundamentally change. Things might get worse though, right? That's about wow. it. Like, it, I've said, like, Sri Lanka's elections are complete. It's not even, not even screwed. It's just useless. It's completely useless. It's a formality, right? It's not like a, it's not like a, it's, 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 it, eerily similar to american elections in that sense actually yeah it's very scenario. eerily yeah. similar to american elections in that they're completely useless right in the sense of like actually even like they don't fundamentally change the the structure of the country or like they don't i mean elections in general don't do much anyways but here like they're all from the same family basically they're all from the same class they're all from the same political class. It doesn't matter. They all suck. They're all awful. That's why I'm saying, like, if you're from Pakistan or India, just be glad you're not, like... Like, Sri Lanka has gotten away with... The, the more that I work on this documentary, and it'll be done in two months, right? It'll be done in a couple months. The more I discover, oh my god, we have, like... Sri Lanka has gotten away with so much. Insanity. Like, it is, they've gotten away with so much. And the fact that no one's called them out is ridiculous. And I it's hope and it, the documentary changes it. Oh, I hope so. Uh, I hope so. I hope uh, people watch it. That's first. Uh, and the other thing is like, yeah, I hope people see that and uh, people realize like, oh, we we probably should be ch uh, talking about Sri Lanka a lot more because. Yeah, uh, we really need to be talking about Sri Lanka because uh, they've gotten away with a lot. And uh, it's not just crimes against Tamils, even though Tamils are the ones that have been like the most under scrutiny and they are the ones that have experienced the, the genocide the most, right? It's not just the Tamils. All the minorities are, are screwed in Sri Lanka. All of them are. Yeah. Okay, before I go, mm -hmm. I wanted your opinion on the college in, in camp in campus in the U.S. and the protests by the students in the since you're there, how mm -hmm. do you see that, and uh, how significant is that? Is that is it gonna change anything? And uh, I don't know about the American elections. I'm, like you said, they're probably as useless as the. But the, the thing is, in the, in the U.K., uh, we still have some hope because of the Greens and the Independents. Uh, Labour is also under pressure. Uh, conservatives are gone, but in the U.S., uh, I don't know much about it. But uh, like, no, it's it's completely. I mean, like yeah. the the other thing, the thing that uh, I mean, Democrats are are a slight step above the Republicans. That's it. There's there's slightly better than the Republicans. Like like a lot of what Biden is doing in Gaza was set forth was the precedent was set forth by Trump. And and Trump was the one that was actually like more gung ho about making Jerusalem the capital of, uh, capital of Israel yeah. and moving the embassy to Jerusalem and and all of that. So it was Trump that yeah, accelerated this. So we wouldn't have this what we have in Gaza without Trump. Um, uh, as far as the student encampments are concerned, one thing that does give me quite a lot of hope uh, with regards to that is that I mean. Student encampments have, you know, traditionally been the, they've been a huge indicator of, you know, societal shifts in thought, right? 
in America talking about Palestine and uh, talking about all of, you know, talking about Palestinian liberation was a non-starter for a long time. Public opinion on that has changed. It has changed. There, were, you were you expecting that? Uh, not, not suddenly. Uh, I would say like, I've been following Palestine for quite a while, and I didn't expect this sudden change in in heart, right? And I think it's because partially due to the fact that people are just oh. online all the time, and they're seeing the war crimes happen to Palestinians, right? Whereas like. Twitter wasn't a thing in 2009, and so you really had to go to different corners of the internet to find well, the actual come. war crimes that were being committed against the town. But on top of that, one thing that oh. that really shocked me was one. there's a guy that goes to Purdue University, and he was at the student encampment. And so I talk about there's an article that was released by the investigative report or investigative project on terrorism. And what it said, the title of it was a Mahinda Rajapaksa plan for the total eradication of Hamas or total annihilation of Hamas. And it's basically, the article is about how Mahinda Rajapaksa went, they did a full scorched earth campaign on the Tamils, right? What you're seeing in Gaza, they did the Tamils, you know, 15 years ago, right? Um, and uh, they basically justified like whatever Israel is doing right now with what Sri Lanka did. And they said, this is what Sri Lanka had to do to get rid of the, ta uh, the Tamil Tigers. And they also said at the end, you know, just like Sri Lanka, Israel should avoid any international accountability because Sri Lanka has also evaded international accountability. Sri Lanka set that precedent. Sri Lanka, like the reason Israel is able to get away with uh, international accountability is partially because no one's held Sri Lanka accountable. Obviously, it's because America is fully in the corner of Israel, right? Uh, Israel is their sort of client in the Middle East, right? They're, it's their, their foothold in the Middle East, right, geopolitically. But um, the reason that... Uh, the reason that no, one, no one's holding Israel accountable is because no one's held Sri Lanka accountable for their actions. And uh, I think that's another reason to it. Well, I talk about this on my stream, on, on my broadcast a lot. Come. And one, this Purdue student told me that they heard these encampment students oh. literally say, yeah, this is what Mahinda Rajapaksa did in Sri Lanka. This is what Mahinda Rajapaksa is doing in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka. This is like uh, in, in Gaza. This is the Mahinda Rajapaksa plan. This is the Mahinda Rajapaksa strategy. This is the Sri Lankan strategy. And they heard it from clips of mine. Oh. And once I saw that, I was like, we're doing this. I was like, we're actually yeah. doing this. This is crazy. That's when I realized, oh, the things are changing. The tide's changing overall on the anti-colonial movement. The tide's changing. Yeah. That's when I realized the, the tides are actually changing. Um, the other thing is, uh, yes, the uh, complicity of so many countries, Western and on and non-Western leads to a lot of, uh, less attention on Sri Lanka. Yeah. It's because of the uh, overall geopolitical con configuration. Yeah. And they credited me for it. Yeah. And it's like, oh, so I am making an impact. Right. So it is like people are talking about it and they're spreading awareness of it. And so I think the encampments provided a really, and especially the teach-ins and, and all of these, uh, movie nights and, uh, I think they provide a really good way of mobilizing and educating others on on uh, anti-colonial movements that didn't exist that that didn't happen prior. Like they all, there were always like student organizations on these campuses, but they didn't really get to. It, there was never this level of mobilization, and I think that's something to be hopeful about. I think that is something to be hopeful about. I think yeah. there's something there that didn't exist the year before or even years prior. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping happens in Pakistan again. Because in the 1960s, Ayub Khan was ousted due to the very strong, mobilized student movements. And that's what I'm hoping again. Uh, yeah. I can, I can only hope and pray.
by the way, if you ever want to show this entire conversation to your friends, to your, to your, it's going to be up on Twitch. Uh, right. and you can always just use it. You can cut it. You know, I'll send you the video, I'll upload it on YouTube and it'll be good to go. And that'll be that. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, no worries. Okay, gotta, gotta go now. Uh, once again, it's been a pleasure. Uh, again, I, I learned a lot. Or, and I need uh, a list of books you've read because, uh, mashallah, mashallah, you're very well read. You pretty much know everything about everything. So I, I, I'd, like I'd, know, okay. I'd like to know, I'd like I'd, to know what you've been reading the past few years. <laughs> oh, actually, I don't read, so I don't read books all that often. I read news articles a lot and I read, yeah, uh, that, that, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. I don't read books all that often. So I, I read, okay. uh, I read book, I read, um, I, I read news articles. There is a book. I just, uh, I'll share it with you later. I shared it with my own Discord uh, server. It's called Massacres of Tamils. And it's a, an entire book of basically every, you know, state crime, every massacre the Sri Lankan state has ever committed against the Tamils starting from 1958 to 2008. It does not cover Mulivaikal massacre. That's a different beast unto itself, right? But it, it covers every single state-sponsored massacre against the Tamils. For seven days, like nearly, uh, you know, for nearly like six, seven, eight decades, basically, right? Mm. That's so it talks about like the horrific atrocities that the Sri Lankan state has committed against the Tamils. I I've been citing that recently quite a bit, uh, uh, uh. They as far as like uh, um. Yeah, I, I mean, I can share you the list of stuff that I've been reading, but, like, it's not like a... Yeah. I wouldn't say I, I, I read a lot of books, per se. Yeah, I'd like that list. Yeah, I'll send it to you on and Twitter. Hope I, thank you. Okay, gotta go. Uh, once again, uh, I really had fun, and uh, I'd like to do this again. Absolutely. I mean, your my show is your show, so whenever you want, just let me uh, know. Uh, you're very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.